come and present to council on the hybrid step plan that was discussed at the retreat. Good afternoon, City Council. All right. During the City Council retreat on March 9th, Siegel Consulting presented several options to implement the market salary survey, including three options with an open pay range system like we currently have today. The lowest cost option was one and a half million dollars, and it simply ensured that employees receiving a market adjustment were placed at least at the minimum of their new pay range assignment. There was a six and a quarter million dollar option, which provided a five or a 10 percent pay increase for employees who were moving one or more pay ranges. So it was a five percent increase for one range, a 10 percent increase for two or more pay ranges. And then there was a $20 million option, which also provided the 5 or 10 percent pay increases, but it also maintained the employees at their current point in their pay range assignment. So for example, if they're currently at the pay range midpoint, when they move to their new pay range assignment, they would also remain at their pay range midpoint. That was the highest cost option. The consultant also provided a step plan option, and this was a step plan for all employees in the workforce, and it was based on the number of years they've been in their uh, position. But more work needed to be done on that. They gave us a cost of $19 million, knowing that there was that work was incomplete and there was more that we needed to do. So City Council discussed this at the retreat, and after uh, that, their discussion, they asked us to bring forth a hybrid option that would include some employees being on the step plan and retaining other employees on an open range system. So the hybrid option recommended by the consultant included a step plan for all of our sworn public safety employees, including the management in um, public safety. It would include all general pay plan employees. Our general pay plan employees are those that are eligible for overtime in accordance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And it would include employees on our administrative pay plan up to pay range 12. Administrative pay plan are those that are exempt from the overtime requirements. On the open range plan, we would retain the higher level professional positions such as our engineers or IT professionals or certain clinicians. We would also have our management staff and our executive staff. So all of those would continue to be on an open range system. Whether you were assigned to the step plan or an open range, your pay range would have a 55 percent spread between the minimum and the maximum of each pay range. So currently, right now, we have a 47 percent spread on the general plan and a 52 percent spread on the administrative plan. So all of the pay ranges would have a 55 percent spread. And salary increases resulting from the market adjustments would be capped at 10 percent for all positions. With the exception of executives, we would cap, cap those at 5 percent. The differences, however, include that, you know, by nature of it being a step plan, the employees would have to be assigned to a step. This step system created places employees on a step based on the number of years they've been in their title, and steps are an average of 3% apart. So as a result, positions that receive a 5 or a 10% pay adjustment may actually receive slightly more than that because we have to place them on a step. There are some advantages to implementing this hybrid approach. Uh, first, it provides public safety with the step plan that they have been requesting because they like the sense of predictability that is associated with the step plan. It provides many of our public works, public utilities, human services employees with that same sense of predictability as uh, would be assigned to the public safety employees. And for those on the open pay range, 
plan, it re retains retention of the supervisor pay progression program. That program is one that moves our supervisors to the midpoint of their pay ranges at a faster pace. There are also some aspects of this that would be challenging. Uh, first, again, is that perception, and that is that the step plan is a guarantee of an annual increase equivalent to a step, and that may need to be continually addressed. There's also the perception that pay increases for those on a step system are paramount or more important than those not on a step plan, which may uh, come to light in lean years. <coughs> And whether you're assigned to a step system or an open range system, it is important to move employees across the pay range towards the midpoint and towards the maximum of their pay range to help prevent salary compression. In lean years, we may be able to give a pay increase, but city council may not be able to give a 3% pay increase, which would mean that those on the step plan may not be able to receive a step increase. So years of that could lead to salary compression, which would be more visible on a step system. It would apply to any system, but it would be more visible on a step system. The supervisor pay program may be uh, eliminated for those on the step system, but for those that are already halfway through their system or have already been uh, given the pay, supervisor pay progression, we would make sure that those uh, are placed close to their pay range midpoint. And for those attaining degrees in the future, the educational incentive that is provided, included in base pay, will now need to be uh, provided outside of base pay because the educational incentive does not correspond to the 3% step increases. They're at one and a half, two and two and a half percent increases. Implementation of the hybrid option will result in a range of compensation adjustments for employees. Most employees would receive a pay increase, but close to 58% will receive less than a 5% increase. And approximately 27% of the workforce will re realize less than $1,000 in increase. And so to put that in perspective, based on the average salary of our employees, a $1,000 increase would be about 1.7%. It would cost us close to $22.3 million to implement this hybrid option. Now we could modify the hybrid option to ensure that all employees receive at least a 5% pay increase. And it could be modified by providing a general increase of up to 5%. This would only apply to those employees who would not receive a 5% through implementation of the market and placement on a step. And this would increase the cost to $31 million. Combined? Yes. Combined? Total. Yes. Salary and benefits, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Alternatively, if the city wanted to provide more than the 5% minimum to employees, uh, city council could opt to only put public safety on a step plan in the upcoming fiscal year and establish a goal of 7% pay increases for the employees. Now close to 18% of the public safety employees will receive a 10% increase or more to place them on the appropriate step in the, in the uh, step plan. And another 23% will receive somewhere between 5 and 10%. So there are many that will receive less than that 7%. To get the remainder as close to 7% as we could, we could provide a 4% general increase uh, to the public safety personnel prior to placement on the step. And since steps are an average of 3%, we would approximate that 7% uh, goal. For non-public safety employees, uh, they would not be put on a step at all, and they would have to be limited to only receiving a one range increase from the market. And then we would provide them with an additional 2% increase to get them to seven. 
and those who are not slated to receive a market adjustment at all would just receive this 7% general increase. This alternative implementation has a cost of $30.6 million. However, there is an additional cost that would have to be incurred the following year if City Council then wanted to place the um, general employees and the a group of the administrative employees on the step plan in the following fiscal year. For sworn public safety after receiving that 4% general increase, depending on how close they are to their step, they could realize less than 7%. They also could realize more than 7%. It just depends on how close they are to that placement. And while every non-public safety employee would be on an open range and therefore it's easier to make sure that they get 7%, some of those non-public safety employees were slated to receive 10% market adjustments. So using this approach, they would not receive their full market adjustment, uh, which means that they could still be behind in the market and they would have received more under the step system. And ad additionally, as I've noted, we would need to um, have funding the following fiscal year if we wanted to then put them on a step. So just a couple of other things I wanted to point out. Uh, one is that the step plan was created with placing employees on a step based on the number of years they've been in their title. We have received requests from some of the public safety leads, as well as some outside of, not, of public safety, to use years of service instead. So what this would mean, for example, if someone has been with the city for, let's say, 15 years, using the 16-step system, they would almost be topped out, regardless of how many years they have been in their current title. So the cost for implementation of a year's service plan would be higher. So based on, for example, the hybrid plan that I mentioned earlier with a $22.3 million cost using years in title, if we change that to years of service, we would approach closer to a $30 million cost. And we'll try to include more uh, examples of that in an upcoming Friday package. The other point I wanted to mention is that if we implement a step system of any sort, uh, we will need time to implement the system. So once City Council makes a decision, we, and we would mean human resources and our IT department, we would need time to go through the data, check for accuracy, make sure that we are ready to implement the system. We think that after your decision, we would need another eight weeks to make sure that we are ready. Uh, so this could make us uh, implement after July 1. Now, if it's the desire of City Council, we could always implement retroactively to July 1, but I did want to bring that to your attention as well. All right, so that is the information that was included in your letter uh, that we wanted to make sure that you had a briefing on. Are there any questions? I have a question. What about the uh, part-time people and hourly wages? Yes. So we, we know that we need to, come July, we will need to take all of the part-timers who are not assigned to the general or administrative pay plan. We would need to take them to at least that $12 an hour. Um, we, there is a cost of somewhere around 200 $50,000 to make that happen. Um, so that would be outside of this. There are some positions that are part-time that are included in this study, but not all. $12 doesn't seem, compared to what other places are, that doesn't right. seem very much. The $12 is the, the federal minimum. There has been a lot of talk uh, or desire expressed for $15 minimum. And what would the cost of that be? So we know that there is a, for our full-time employees, there's a cost of about one and a half million dollars. However, if we implement the market in some form, some of that is going to be shaved off. So, you know, probably less than a million for that. And then we would have 
uh, those part-timers that are uh, not on the pay plan, we would have to account for those. Uh, Management Service did a an estimate, and we're not saying that this is exactly what it would be, but they did do an estimate of that cost, and that was about $2 million, $2.4 million, to get them to $15 an hour. And none of that, though, is, is in the proposed budget? That is not part of the uh, market implementation at all. Anybody else? John? When we start off, I always <laughs> like to go back. We are trying to solve a problem. <laughs> so that's why we did the market survey to find out where we were not paying in the market. That was where we started. It seems like we've moved off on all the options here from addressing that issue first and foremost, because that's why we did the study to find out where we weren't competitive or weren't as competitive as we wanted to be. I think that might be a better way of expressing that. And when I was on my way back from, I'm getting to Mrs. Vice Mayor Wilson's point, on my way back, this is a Bucky's gas station. Now hiring full time, associate 17, this is in Florida, no income tax Florida, 17 to $21 an hour for an associate. Food service, people making your sandwiches and this, 19 to $21. Team lead, 24 to 23. Department lead, because they have a lot of merchandising, if you've ever been on those, 24 to 34. <clears throat> Three weeks paid vacation, up to 6% match on your 401k. Pretty significant, I think. Mm -hmm. And full pay of health insurance for the single person. This is at a retail establishment, 56,000 square feet with 200 gas pumps, if you can imagine what that would look like. <laughs> and... And if you worked at night, $2 extra for overnight. I don't think we're in the same market. Obviously, we're not out there generating a profit. And obviously, they must be getting people to pay the price they couldn't charge. But to Ms. Wilson's point, I think when we're talking about what should be our first priority building block <laughs> is what action do we first have to take to meet with our original action was to get to the market competition for our jobs. That's like tier one, we got to get there, and then after we know what that costs, then I'm, what, are our, uh, what are the options we can go from there? Because that's what we started to solve. And I think when we say, oh, but well, we didn't, because I don't think 15 is going to be enough. I'm with the vice mayor on that. So we look and say, what are that? And we look at these other jobs that aren't at the market and bring them up. What does that cost? Because I think we haven't done due diligence if we haven't fulfilled why we did the study to start with. And now, what are the options up from that? And at what point does it exceed our ability to do up front or a phasing plan to achieve? But there's a lot of stuff with step increases, and I have a lot of experience. I worked under one, except for five, four years when we were under a demonstration program. So maybe 38 years under a step system. And I, for about 10, 12 years, I made a lot less than people who worked for me because I advanced quickly. And when you advance, you don't, you aren't, get, you get a six percent raise. That's it, and and you're at the same. Doesn't mean you're going to make more money. You just have the opportunity to make more money, but you don't make it up front. So, what are the mechanics? I guess that's the part you would still. Are we going to know the mechanics of the step system? Is it going to be like, I assume that someone could work their career at, at the end and end it. That they top out at 20. Is it 10 steps, 50? I think these are important questions to understand because. We know people have step systems, right? Right. They have the same attrition problems we have in public safety, the same recruitment problems we have in public safety. So the step system itself hasn't solved that problem by the structure itself. Maybe the pay might, but the structure of steps didn't solve it. So it'd be interesting to know what we're trying to achieve other than predictability. That's good to know. But I do think we, we need to know, to my peers, what it takes to bring everyone up to what we thought was that market competitive pay. I think implementing something that solves a problem we don't know that it'll fix, but doesn't meet the intent of what we adopted is gonna, I don't have to manage the morale problem, that's the city managers, but we are creating a management problem for him to manage when we haven't addressed that fundamental problem. So I, I hope when you come back, you can share with us What's that foundation thing, the cost to fix and get everyone to their market competitive? I think you had some principles, but these people kind of left out. And then what would be the additional cost of then moving 
to some of these other options because I don't want to not meet the, the minimum that we that the study recommended for all our employees. But there is a top line we can afford to pay. And I just want to understand Who's what we think. Ms. Stanley, just a minute. But what you're saying is if you think back all the years we kept putting money into compression and we just didn't seem to be fixing it. I mean, years and years of, okay, we're going to put another $4 million. We're going to put, we kept putting money into compression and, until we put a really big chunk. If we thought we'd fix it then, we still didn't fix it. So compression is sort of like what you're talking about. Can I come back to that? Because that was my next point. I know, but this is an important item because it's, you know, about over half our budget. So it's when you're making these kind of decisions, you are make, you are raising your structural fixed cost over time. And my experience in a step system is that Congress, knowing that they had those fixed obligations, when they came to do cost of living adjustments, they just reduced those because they knew what the, what the fixed compensation was in the steps. And so they just reduced the cost of living part because, like you just said, that can become very expensive to do that. So they say, oh, steps are 3%, inflation is 5%, oh, we 2% raise. I mean, because they knew the agencies, I mean, so, but the pressure is to get the 3% of the steps, plus they want the 5% cost of living. So you have to understand the behavior patterns that systems incentivize, and, and are you prepared to deal with that? And I, probably the managers probably worked in places that had those, and mm -hmm. other places you've seen it. We just, and I think that's part maybe the budget people can tell us is, you know, what's, the, when you buy into any change, I don't care if it's open range or whatever it is, you're buying into some fixed structural cost, and you have to know, does your labor grow faster than revenue over time? And then when you get a big change in the economy, you do end up having to lay people off because you're obligated to pay these steps or pay the open range. I'm just, I just don't, I'm not in a hurry to make a decision because I think it just needs a lot more discussion. But I just would like to close saying I think the first step is knowing what does it cost to achieve the objective of the initial reason for doing the study was to make sure we were paying everyone, I think at the mid-range of the competitive market, I think was, and then where can we go from there? But Barbara. thank you, Vice Mayor. Barbara. I'm concerned about all that has happened in this whole salary stuff that's out there. Is our market survey still valid? Because so many things have changed in the past even month or so, are we testing or do we have a way to update it to make it valid from the time that it was done, which I guess was sometime last year? But then also the question dealing with compression, if we raise the, the lower level salaries to get them up to a, a higher minimum wage, doesn't that trigger compression throughout the whole system? And how are we going to address that? So the data for the survey was based on the fall of last year. And in any survey, you're, you're going to have that lag. You're going to have some time period between collecting the data and implementing the data. But yes, we are concerned about that as well because we know, <clears throat> excuse me, that the market has been moving so quickly. Um, the consultant feels pretty confident in the data that we have because we are using a, a, a longer spread right now, even though many of our comparables, our surrounding cities, also use a long pay range already. Um, but they feel as if because of our pos positions and how we were paid, that we still have <clears throat> some flexibility to still be competitive if we implement this study. But you're right. It is a concern about whether or not we will be as competitive as we thought we would be with implementation of this. Um, as far as your other question about the uh, increase in the hourly rate and whether or not that would cause compression, we will definitely have to make sure that if we move the, if we move the employees to $12 like the federal minimum wage requires in January, that won't be a problem with salary compression. If we do the $15, which um, seems to be, you know, where a lot of organizations are going, public and private, then yes, we will need to make sure that we look at all of our positions to um, 
ensure that all of our employees are paid that, that amount and look at what, time, what types of adjustments we would need to make. Probably would not need to make a monumental amount, but we will have to make some adjustments based on the 15. Did you factor that into that estimate that you gave us of what it would cost, or is that still in addition? There, there would be a slightly more in addition to that. Ms. Wooten. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hilliard, and thank you for your presentation on this very important program. Certainly. I know a lot of um, uh, staff, you know, including public safety and regular staff are looking uh, for us to do the right thing. And uh, for many years, you know, there are some departments who really feel like they have been uh, not compensated uh, fairly and so um, this is going to be a really big step for us but I think we also have to look at the history um, of staff and how they've been compensated I think that's going to be very important especially during these times um, Councilmember Moss highlighted a very uh, important part here uh, concerning that example with um, the gas station we're no longer in competition with other municipalities. We're in competition with everybody. And when you have that kind of fierce competition, you don't step up to the plate, we're gonna have some issues. We already are talking about the, uh, this great, um, I don't know, they call it the great, not the great recession, but people are leaving in droves. Great resignation. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're leaving in droves and it's, it's problematic. And, but I understand um, they have good reason. Uh, there are a lot of concerns that haven't been addressed, benefits, compensation, and so they're, they're looking for some relief and leadership from this body. Um, but I would also like to mention in terms of Chesapeake, I know Chesapeake has a STEP program, Suffolk has a STEP program. I'm interested in knowing how they have implemented their program and what and how they've been able to do it in a successful manner. Um, so I, I'm, I want to find out how they've been able to, to do so and what can we learn from them? Uh, is there a way we can get that information? Because it's, you know, as was mentioned, there are other municipalities already doing it. So how do we do it and how do we do it successfully? So I would like to get some information on that. Um, and if we don't know how, I'd like to kind of follow up on that and find out how we can do that comparison and see how it's already been done and then see how we can do it successfully. Yes, we're aware that Chesapeake is implementing. We are aware that uh, Chesterfield is implementing or Ches Chesterfield implemented uh, this past year. We have been in contact with some of them and we are continuing those conversations to to just have some lessons learned, as you said, so that we don't enter into this territory uh, blind. <clears throat> so yes, we're, we're engaged in those conversations, and we'll be glad to provide you with some of the information that we find out. Sure, I, I, I would like to see that, and I think it's important for this body to also see that as well, um, that it can be done successfully, and we should be looking at that information. John. When the education pay and the other pay move out of, well, one's in base pay, one's not, and I forget which it is. But when it moves out of base pay, that would also mean it would be a supplement. Does that mean it would no longer be in part of the VRS calculation, correct? That's correct. I just want to make sure that everybody, that there's always trade-offs and that people understand what all the trade-offs are. So that would no longer. And since step systems haven't really addressed for anybody attrition or recruiting problems anywhere, so if we still were dealing with that, then issues like re uh, longevity pay. Longevity pay is the one that's in the base, mm -hmm. right? And educational incentive pay is not. Correct. Well, educational incentive right now is is in the base. But, uh, but, but it would come out of the base under step. That's what, but longevity pay would still be in the base salary, right? Well, or not. I'm we trying. would look. We would try to include it. We that's one of the things that we would have to work through is because again, that's also not corresponding to the. 3%. Which is why I'm asking that question, and because there's a lot of little mechanic issues. And then if we, I just want to make sure that whatever system we adopt, Mr. City Manager, that 
because I don't think this is going to solve until the attitude of the, the country as a whole changes about law enforcement. I think retention of law enforcement recruitment is going to remain a tough job, personally. Uh, I don't think that's going to ease off anytime soon. But if we went to retention pay, that would be a pay supplement as well, correct? More so than we, likely, yes. Like a signing bonus. Mm -hmm. Signing bonus. The military bonuses. has been offering about the 50K for specially as enlisted. You know, if you're 18 years old, that's a lot of money. Uh, but uh, I'm just trying to make sure that it's compatible with that. So because <coughs> Because we still have the issue of having keeping people on board, which is step hasn't done anywhere else, but also building up our staffing and the step plan by itself doesn't fill that problem. It doesn't doesn't respond or answer that problem. Mm -hmm. And Virginia, I think longevity is already implemented. Yes, yeah. that's already been done. Yep, that's a one time. But they, I think he's referring to the, the professional development. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for a really informative, important <laughs> presentation. Certainly. All right. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, um, the members from the school board, starting with Dr. Aaron Spence, will come and give an update on the school's proposed budget. Chairman for being here. I hope so. Well, good we are. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council, it's great to see you all and thank you for this opportunity for us to share today. On behalf of the school board, I'm Carolyn Rye. Chairwoman of the School Board of Virginia Beach, and on behalf of my colleagues, I'm pleased to be here today to present to you the Virginia Beach City Public Schools fiscal year 22-23 budget document. This is a rep representation of what we prioritize as a school board and as a school division. We believe the initiatives outlined in this plan are essential to providing VBCPS students and staff with the supports they need to succeed as they begin to recover from stressors of the health pandemic and continue to focus on the future. Our proposed spending plan includes a well-earned and necessary compensation boost for our employees. In addition to the combined 5% cost of living and step increase, this document provides for an increased allowance for those employees with advanced degrees and a reclassification of teacher assistance and security assistance to a higher pay grade while offering allowances for those with bachelor's degrees. Further, a division investment of roughly $8.5 million in employee health care premium subsidies is ex expected to generate up to a 40% decrease or more in employee contribution rates, representing significant cost savings. In total, $49 million in this budget is allocated to additional compensation funding. We had every reason at the time this budget was approved by the school board to believe that these strategies would make us more competitive in the Hampton Roads market, and we remain convinced of the prudence of addressing these long-term unmet needs. That said, new information with respect to salary raises in our surrounding school divisions that will impact our ability to compete from a recruitment and retention standpoint will be shared later in this presentation. This proposed budget also includes funding for additional supports for our English learner and special education populations and the environmental studies program at the Brock Center. For the first time in more than a decade, this year's Capital Improvement Program, otherwise known as CIP, provides an opportunity to make more aggressive gains in our modernization and replacement program, ensuring that every student and staff member is in an environment healthy, safe, and conducive to teaching and learning. To that end, the proposed CIP fully funds a new Princess Anne High School and a new B.F. Williams Bayside sixth grade campus replacement and significantly, significantly increases funding for the replacement of Bayside High School. 
the construction of the classroom addition at Lynn Haven Middle School, which supports the Achievable Dream Academy Secondary School Program, is funded and underway with a planned 2023 opening. So in closing, even under the extraordinary circumstances of the past school year, I'm so proud to report that our schools have thrived. For example, for the 12th consecutive year, we reached a record on-time graduation rate while continuing to lower the dropout rate. In the first state assessments administered in two years by the Virginia Department of Education, our students tested better than those in many local divisions and bested the statewide average. Rosemont Elementary School was one of only two schools in Hampton Roads to be recognized by the American School Counselor Association for delivering an exemplary school counseling program. And Windsor Oaks Elementary School was one of only seven in the entire state of Virginia to be named a 2021 National Blue Ribbon School by the U.S. Department of Education. These accomplishments and so many others are a testament to the great work that goes on in our schools each and every day. I want to personally thank the mayor and city council and the vice mayor for their ongoing steadfast support of our schools. The board looks forward to continuing our col collaboration as we navigate a post-pandemic world and maintain Virginia Beach's renown as a world-class destination for families. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Aaron Spence. Thank you, Chairman Rye. Thank you all and good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council. So despite the ongoing challenges that were mentioned of managing education of our future citizens while also keeping them as safe as possible during this health pandemic, we are pleased to present you with a document that reflects and accounts for the resilience and the dedication of our entire staff and a plan to retain them and attract more to join our school division. Something we've learned during the past two years is the importance of face-to-face -face learning especially for our youngest students. And I'm so proud to note that since the beginning of the 2021-22 school year, we have been able to keep our schools open for instruction five days a week. We've worked very closely with the Virginia Department of Health, not only to monitor our layered prevention strategies, but also to track cases of COVID-19 in our buildings and host vaccination clinics in our schools in order to continue to persevere. We know this pandemic has had dramatic impacts on our resources and on our staff, both instructional and non-instructional. And it's forced, just like you all were just talking about, a focus on our hiring and our retention strategies. But again, we've been able to stay open and we continue to ensure that our students are loved and cared for and they feel a deep sense of belonging in our classrooms. And of course, above all else, we've maintained our focus on teaching and learning that meets our highest expectations for students and for ourselves. Our proposed $872.5 million operating budget encompasses the wide range of requirements that it takes to run our schools every day. However, simply moving forward as we have is not enough. We know we have to be more competitive in the job market, not only for educators, but for the support staff who keep our students fed, get them from place to place, and keep them safe while in our care. We must plan for and embrace new and better wages if we're going to be able to compete for qualified individuals to fill those positions. Therefore, compensation remains a top priority for the fiscal year 2022-2023 for the school board. Given what our staff members have accomplished in these extraordinary circumstances, we think it's both appropriate and warranted. To keep compensation at the top of our list, we made it a priority to take a careful look at our spending in central office and to ensure we focused on bolstering the programs we have in place rather than focusing on any new initiatives. For the second year in a row, we're recommending a 4.5% increase in cost of living adjustment and a half a percent step increase for those reaching or below the top of scale for all of our employees. In addition, as you heard a little bit about, as has been recommended by our human resources team, we're also recommending the reclassification of teacher assistance and security assistance to a higher pay grade and providing allowances for those with bachelor's degrees. These decisions are in line with recent actions taken by the board to adjust pay grades for other work groups, including our bus drivers and our custodians. We've also budgeted for increased allowances for those employees with advanced degrees, which is part of a three-year phase-in that began last year. And because our efforts to, to secure classroom substitutes during the pandemic with increased pay have proven to be effective, we're also recommending 
increasing substitute pay from $100 to $115 a day. On top of these pay increases, as was noted earlier, we also thought it was important to make substantial progress on health care costs for our employees. We know health care costs in our division are currently higher than we'd like them to be and cause us to be ranked amongst the lowest in the seven cities um, in terms of our competitiveness for health care premiums for our employees. Lowered health care costs will make us more competitive in recruitment and retention and will allow us to make substantial gains in those rankings amongst the other school divisions in Hampton Roads. Something that, uh, again, has been a significant challenge for us in the recruitment process. While compensation increases are our top priority, we also have to bolster other resources, particularly for our growing English as a second language uh, families population, by increasing the number of instructional positions across all grades by eight and adding bilingual support staff to our Family and Community Engagement Welcome Center. To maintain the safety of our learning environment and continuity of operations in times of crisis and disaster, it's become clear to us that we need to hire an emergency manager who will be responsible for disaster mitigation, preparedness, planning, response, and recovery, and help support the school division's emergency operations plan. It's also important to note, uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year 2023, the city and the school division will no longer share legal services. We will bring city legal staff under our budget, our currently assigned city legal staff under our budget, and we'll establish our own legal department with this budget. The reason that we're on such firm financial ground today and why we're able to provide our students and staff with the mar remarkable amount of support that we did during these extraordinary times is thanks to our award-winning budget staff, our finance staff, and to the support of our school board and to you all, our city council. Together, we've managed to get through this. We've managed federal pandemic relief funding, and we've managed our budget and will continue to do so. And it's, we've proven again and again the importance of our ability to be good stewards of the significant public investment in our schools. I'm very grateful to work for a school division where we do this by putting our students and our staff first and keeping our focus on providing a world-class education. And we're doing just that. As Ms. Rye noted earlier, despite the ongoing pandemic-related, I suppose I'm supposed to be clicking along here. I apologize. Um, as Ms. Rye noted earlier, despite the ongoing pandemic-related obstacles, Virginia Beach City Public Schools has continued to thrive. And as you heard, once again, amidst a global health crisis, our graduation rate went up, not down, and I'm pleased that we were able to be together in person for our commencement ceremonies, thanks to some meticulous planning and hard work, and even advocacy on part of some members of our board and council to let us go do that at the amphitheater, which was incredible, and another example of how we love to go the extra mile for our families and our community. In addition, in addition to what Chairman, Chairwoman Rye shared earlier, here are a few more accomplishments from another remarkable school year. Members of that graduating class last year were offered more than $62 million in scholarships, which was a 30% increase over the previous year. Our division teamed up with Naval Air Station Oceano on Project Search, which is a program connecting high school students with intellectual and developmental disabilities to internships and on-the-job training. NAS, NAS Oceana is the Navy's first installation in the country to host the innovative program, and our partnership supports our military families and provides pathways to building student independence. And for demonstrating our major commitment to supporting students and families connected to our nation's military, 27 Virginia Beach City Public Schools were named 2021-22 Virginia Purple Star Schools. These are awards presented by the Virginia Department of Education and the Virginia Council on the Interstate Compact on the Educational Opportunity for Military Children. Even when our students could not physically be in our buildings, 1,659 volunteers found ways to continue to help our students and staff and contributed more than 19 thousand hours to our school communities during the 2020-21 school year and we're so pleased that those volunteers are now finding their way back into our buildings. Our beach bags program distributed more than 19,000 bags to families in need and the Virginia Beach Education Foundation gave out $174,000 in grants for innovative teaching and learning in our schools. During the pandemic, our Office of Food Services, Central Office, and School Cafeteria staff worked on-site as essential personnel supporting USDA and VDOE school nutrition program efforts 
to feed our community's children nonstop from the beginning. Our staff offered at times three meals per day as well as four day weekend meal bags and seven day meal packs during school breaks and holidays. And our Office of Food Services served more than 8 million meals between March 17th of 2020 when schools were closed and June 22nd of 2021. Truly making a difference on child hunger in our community. Our new virtual peer tutoring program has connected 423 student tutors with 677 students this year. And as a part of our continued to commitment to carry out board policy 5-4, educational equity, VBCPS completed a division-wide equity assessment and is in the process right now of working with an administrative equity planning committee to draft our equity plan. Our Department of Technology issued 1,112 hotspots to families to assist with internet access during the pandemic. And for 12 consecutive years, something we're very proud of, we've been named one of the best communities for music education by the National Association of Music Merchants Foundation for our outstanding commitment to the arts here in Virginia Beach. It's important to note that less than 5% of school districts across the nation earned this prestigious award, and Virginia Beach has earned it for 12 consecutive years. In addition to our operating budget, we, of course, recognize the need for ongoing capital improvements across the division, which is another part of our commitment to ensure that every student and staff member is in an environment that is healthy, safe, and conducive for teaching and learning. This capital improvement program funds the maintenance of nearly 11 million square feet of space by investing in our existing infrastructure through projects such as re-roofing, making HVAC improvements, and replacing outdated playground equipment, and this capital improvement program that we are uh, submitting to you also fully funds the notable projects described earlier. As you can see, we have been building upon the lessons learned over the past years, bringing every bit of innovation and creativity to bear, but we also know there is a great deal of work ahead. Our students and staff face significant challenges as we come out of the pandemic. These challenges are academic, they are behavioral, they are social, they are emotional and they are economic and they will take time, energy and a commitment of this entire community to address, to sustain what we all expect from our public schools. But we are committed to make this work. We will do everything possible to keep the children, teachers and support staff of Virginia Beach safe in our learning environments and to provide them and their families with the tools needed to thrive and succeed in the next school year. At this time, I'm pleased to turn it over to our Chief Financial Officer, Crystal Pate, who will address the specifics of the budget and the funding mechanisms within the CIP. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council, and, Dr. and Mr. Dehaney. Thank you for this opportunity. Please note that this proposed budget is based on the prior governor's proposed state budget, which is not adopted. As you know, General Assembly is back in special session, and we could see changes to this existing budget depending on the actions coming out of this session, as well as an amendment to our categorical grants fund due to a significant increase in Title I funding and the award of a large ARP HVAC coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery grant that was received in the latter part of this fiscal year and that will likely end with a carryover greater than the proposed budget contingency budgeted in, in the categorical grants run for fiscal year 22-23. I'm going to share with you some slides you've seen in the past. I'm trying to figure out which way to go. Um, that just shows the school operating fund and varying breakdowns. This slide shows you the total amount of all funds totaling a little over $1 billion, with the operating fund being the largest piece of the budget at 79.6%. This next slide shows you our revenue sources and related percentages that comprise the school operating fund. As you can see, the local contribution from the city is the largest funding source at 49.7%. State funding, including state sales tax, make up the second largest source at 48.2%. The federal source comes in at 1.5%. Other sources of revenue make up about 0.4%, and 0.1% represents the use of one-time funds in our school reserve account. This is the first year we are reducing the amount by 50% of the fiscal year 2022 budgeted amount of approximately $1.3 million. 
When we look at the school operating fund by major cate category classification, as you would expect, the instructional portion is the largest at 73.3%. Operations and maintenance is the second largest portion at 11.8%. Both pupil transportation and administration attendance and health are coming in at 5.2%, and technology is coming in at 4.6%. It is important to note that these specific categories are prescribed by the State Board of Education and listed in Virginia Code. And our chart of accounts is built around these categories for budgeting and reporting purposes. This last chart shows school operating expenditures by type. As you can see, we're a very labor intensive business and combining our personnel and fringe benefits costs total just over 85%. The rest of the other types total a little under 15%. And most of that 15% is non-discretionary due to items such as ongoing contractual obligations, fuel, utilities, et cetera. So there's only a small percentage of that 15% that allows any discretionary spending or flexibility. So just really quickly, how did we go about budget, ba balancing the budget for, for the fiscal year 22-23? This slide represents our proposed revenue estimates for fiscal year 22-23 compared to the adopted revenue for fiscal year 21-22. Based on that latest information we had to date, we are estimating additional revenue over fiscal year 2022 adopted budget from all sources to be almost $47 million. This slide shows you the breakdown of this amount. Over half of this additional revenue, $26 million, is expected from the revenue sharing formula with the city. The revenue sharing formula estimates estimate represents the amount provided in the city's five-year forecast and is not updated for any additional estimates related to the overperformance of city revenues. The state is expected to increase by $11.6 million, and state sales tax is estimated to increase approximately $10 million. As mentioned during our five-year forecast presentation, we were going to begin to phase out the use of the one-time funds in the school reserve account. So again, this was the first year that we're proposing to reduce that amount by 50% of the fiscal year 22 budgeted amount. And so that 0.1% I mentioned earlier is being used to balance the budget for fiscal year 2023. In balancing the budget, this slide shows you what items were used to budget and balance to this additional $47 million. It demonstrates that the primary focus of this budget is for compensation for our employees through raises, reclassifications, increased allowances, and better employee health premiums. As Ms. Rye and Dr. Spence highlighted a number of these items in their opening remarks, their largest use of these additional revenues was to use to provide a 5% raise to our employees. Note that the state is providing us some funding to provide this raise to SOQ positions, and based on our composite index, we are to provide a local match for this group of employees, and in turn, we are funding the raise for our non-SOQ positions. There's also a substantial investment we are making to lower the employee health insurance premiums. Working with our third-party consultant, it was determined with an investment of approximately $8.5 million, we can expect to see a decrease in employees' health premiums in the range of 40 to 50 percent for active employees and retirees. We also work to keep a permanent increase in the substitute rate, going from the old rate of $100 a day to $115 a day in an effort to continue to recruit substitutes. As I mentioned, we are bolstering our resources for our English language learners, families, so you can see the funding listed here for eight additional ESL teachers and the cost to revise current employee contracts from 10 month to 10 month extended. As Dr. Spence mentioned, um, we are bringing the legal department into our, our own house and that is approximately additional cost of about 503,000 over and above the amount that we were using to do interdepartmental transfers between the city and the schools. We also began the process of converting our 10-month custodians to 12-month for the latter part of this fiscal year in an effort to recruit and retain staff. You can see the annual cost for this change to continue is estimated at $1.1 million. We have added some funding for technology and system maintenance, such as security software, backup disaster recovery, and computer software, like ClassLink for single sign-on access, Let's Talk, a cloud-based administrative communications tool, and Qualtrics, an online survey software. And finally, to balance this proposed budget, we made some baseline adjustments to personnel and fringe benefit line items using current spending levels to establish future funding requirements and realign positions take into account estimated enrollment. We were also able to do some targeted reductions to non-personnel line items where we believe the budget could be reduced based on expenditure patterns. This slide shows all the compensation items proposed to be funded in the budget. This slide also totals about $47 million, which coincides with our estimated additional revenue for fiscal year 23. 
The point here is we've taken all the additional estimated revenue and dedicated to some form of compensation. In addition, we also needed to cut some $8 million in the baseline to balance and fund some, some non-compensation items that needed to be funded. We wanted to be sure that we made it clear that this was our direction we took and that compensation was our focus. This slide top, touches on a topic I know the city is dealing with as well, but it would be missed not to share our situation. Even as our proposed budget includes a 5% raise for our employees, since the release of our proposed budget, several neighboring school div div districts published their proposed raises, and you can see them here on this slide. Chesapeake Public Schools, one of our main competitors for staffing, came in with a 10% increase for teachers, 14% increase for support staff, and 5% for administrative staff, with a statement from their superintendent that any additional monies they receive will be directed to administrative compensation. You can see other neighboring school districts also came in with raises at or higher than Virginia Beach for teachers and support staff. This puts Virginia Beach City Public Schools at a deficit in attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers and support staff. We are at a critical juncture when it comes to the issue of staffing our schools. The fact that these neighboring districts are able to provide their teachers and support staff with higher raises will likely have a significantly negative impact on our school system in hiring teachers, custodians, cafeteria workers, etc. A lack of sufficient qualified teachers threatens students' ability to learn, and a stability in school teacher workforce such as high turnover and high attrition negatively affects student achievement and diminishes teacher effectiveness and quality. High teacher turnover consumes economic resources through costs of recruiting and training new teachers that otherwise could be better deployed elsewhere. Just alone, the inability to hire and retain enough teachers to staff our classrooms when school opens to approximately 64,000 students could result in the need to increase our class sizes in order to utilize the teachers we will have on board in the fall. <clears throat> this last item I'm going to share with you surrounds the potential elimination of the grocery tax to localities. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, we still do not have a state budget. Of concern is the action the state will take regarding the 1% allocation locally received by the city via the general fund, which is shared with the schools through the revenue sharing formula. If the General Assembly takes action to eliminate this revenue source, the estimated impact as a loss of revenue is approximately $13.1 million, with the split between city and schools resulting in an estimated loss to the schools of approximately $6.1 million, which for reference closely equates to a 1% raise for our staff. We cannot stress the importance for the schools to be able to adequately fund competitive compensation for fiscal year 2022-23 and then the future in order to continue to attract and retain, retain highly qualified staff. And I will leave with, the, with this. CBS News reported that a survey conducted by Nietzsche.com on the 50 best places to live in America in 2022 among major cities with populations above 100,000, the city of Virginia Beach is new to that 2022 list, and that is in thanks in part to its highly rated public schools. At this time, I turn the presentation over to Jack Freeman. He's our Chief Operations Officer to go over our CIP information. Can I ask a question before he comes up? I'm, I'm just, because it relates to CIP, but it deals with compensation. First, I applaud you for putting your discretionary money where you think was most important, but it will come back to the CIP. I was curious why last February 1st, when you asked for $48 million, $54.9 million back, I mentioned why none of that money went to compensation. I think you could do more than what you've done, and you could fill more of that gap if you didn't accelerate the CIP, but I'll address those questions. But you have assets to use that you didn't use. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Good afternoon. I'm Jack Freeman, Chief Operations Officer. As you all know, Tony Arnold, who's been with us for a very long period of time. He served the school division, the facilities Let's team for call you Tony. Is it okay? 30 plus years. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Nobody else is like Tony. Uh, we miss him, but we do have uh, Melissa Ingram with us here this afternoon. She's our new executive director for facilities, so you'll be seeing more of her in the future. For our CIP highlights, uh, construction is in progress for the classroom addition at Lynn Haven Middle School to support an Achievable Dream Academy. Uh, secondary school program, and the project is currently scheduled to be completed in time for school opening in September of 2023. Our next three school replacement projects, Prince Sand High School, Betty F. Williams, and Bayside 6, and the Bayside High School are all included in this CIP with Prince Sand High School and Betty F. Williams projects both fully funded in the six-year CIP. You'll also see that through the proposed use of our 2020-2021 reversion funds, uh, together with state construction grants included in the state's proposed budget, that we've been able to provide significantly more funding earlier in the, uh, in the CIP 
for all of these three much needed projects, uh, particularly for Bayside High School. This together with the ongoing PPA pro process provides us the opportunity to potentially deliver these pr three projects sooner than we had previously projected at an overall lower capital cost. Historically, inflation for con school construction is about 4.8 to 5.6% 5, 5. annually. So for a high school size project in the latter 2020s, every year that a project is delayed equates to roughly seven to $10 million of increase in the cost of the project. This CIP, while dedicating resources to longstanding modernization and replacement program, also continues our commitment to maintaining our 11 million square feet of facilities and infrastructure. And I'll let you review this slide. Any questions? I was going to wait to the end. Okay, thank you. I, oh, okay. Well, I do have a question. I do believe in the adopted CIP in May of 2021, both Princess Anne High School and Betty F. Williams were fully programmed and fully funded. Is that not correct? That's my CIP shows that I got from the city saying approved. Is that not correct? So if I may, can I continue with the presentation and oh, we'll take all the were, questions at the end? Oh, I, I was just letting you review the slide oh, before I moved on. I thought you had stopped. <laughs> uh, total projected cost for the six-year CIP, including appropriations to date, uh, is approaching $650 million, uh, with uh, year one, 22 to 23, proposed at $83.2 million. All these amounts are reflective of alternative A of our funding sources. And here's the breakdown of those numbers. You'll see throughout the CIP the continued use of charter bonds and public facility revenue bonds, uh, a small but steady increase in the use of PAYGO funding from the operating budget. You also see the school board's commitment from last year towards continuing to reinvest at least 11 to $12 million annually in reversion funds into the CIP as previously requested by members of the city council. The single biggest change for this year, for the first time in more than a decade, includes the potential help from Richmond in the form of state construction grants. That's $21.4 million in grant funding, including in the proposed budget. So you're likely aware that the state CIP funding support has not occurred since roughly 2010, when lottery funds, which had previously been directed for education, were incorporated into the general fund. This uh, resulted in a significant delay in school replacement projects. So for example, from 1990 to 1999, funding was available to start construction on 17 schools. From 2000 to 2009, funding was available to start construction on 19 schools. Since 2010, more than a decade, and that's the time frame since that state funding was not available, funding has only supported starting six schools. <clears throat> For the next decade, the CIP can support construction starting at three schools. If you take a look at uh, 4.1 under the modernization and replacement program in the, uh, uh, in the proposed CIP, you can see the funding challenge that we face with our modernization programs. The next two schools after Bayside High School are First Colonial High School and Kempsel High School. Under this CIP, those schools cannot be funded to start construction until 2039 and 2046, respectively. Those are our next two schools outside of the CIP. Those schools will be between 76 and 83 years old by the time replacements are constructed. You'll be able to see after studying this funding summary in more detail that the inclusion of state, uh, state construction grants has provided much needed additional funding in the three modernization replacement projects, providing an opportunity to advance these projects sooner. And we're hopeful that this state funding will become a common practice to help sustain a reasonable modernization or replacement program for schools. Because the state construction grants have not gone final, we also included an alternative B in our funding sources that did not include that $21 million. This option reflects zero in the state construction grants, and that's highlighted in green. And if the state construction grants is not approved, uh, here's the alternative B funding summary. You can see the corresponding year one adjustments in green, which include $1 million reduction in renovations, replacements, various a uh, $10 million reduction in the Betty F. Williams Bayside 6 replacement and a little over $10 million reduction in Bayside High School. We look forward to working with you to finalize the CIP budget and responding to your questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Smith. Hey, Rosemary and John. 
Well, thank you. I promise not to call you Tony. So. It's okay. um, I, was, I, was, I was joking. You can call me whatever you want. I was joking, too. So I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, the, well, first of all, we, we did so many, I was around on the school board when we did the bond referendum back that didn't pass in 99, I think it was. But we did fund a lot of schools because back then an elementary school was about 11, 12 million dollars to do. So we were able to get a lot more done and get those under our belts. And of course now an elementary school is going to be 68 million. That's, um, and I think we did Kellum for about 107, 108 million. And Princess Anne's going to be 162 million, and Bayside's going to be 197 million. So I'm, I am getting to a question. Um, it, it looks like the further out they go, the more expensive the schools are getting. That's the deduction. So are we able to save some money by moving the, the costs up? I mean, moving the timeline up for, for Princess Anne and for Betty F. Williams? Yes, ma'am. So by looking, and that's the 4.8 uh, to 5.6 historical <coughs> inflation that we've seen, and that's by looking at the last couple of decades uh, back to early 2000, that's the inflation. And when you apply that to a project, a high school size project in the late uh, 2020s, what that means is it's on the order of 7 to $10 million. Every year you move it, you're either saving 7 to $10 million or it's going to cost 7 to $10 million more. And that will increase over time, but that's just a target in the late 2020s based on that inflation rate. So the 162 for Princess Anne, it seemed to me that was the cost before you moved it up. Is that right? Did that did that cost change any in your in your predictions? Oh, for the actual projections, uh, we may have to get that uh, that answer for you for how the calculations went uh, to get to that number. And I know that <clears throat> you're talking about the last three, but those are all high schools, and they're going to be really big ticket items. And that's correct. I just can't wrap my hand around how much they're going to cost us. But thank you for, and I know y'all build beautiful schools. Um, it's it's very exciting. I was at Lynn Haven with you a week or so ago yep. with Mr. Bellucci, and uh, getting ready for the uh, Achievable Dream Academy there. So. Thank you. Thank hey, you, John. Mr. Mayor. Well, I appreciate you have the luxury of a single mission. We don't. Um, and I think that uh, you do have capital needs. Families have capital needs. They have challenges. And you could often, if you look at the forecasters, would say the cost of materials two years out will be less than they are now. So I don't, I don't think you can claim linear analysis to more sense. <laughs> this is an atypical spike that no one expects to last. But I do want to come back to my question. Is it not true that Princess Anne High School and Betty F. Williams were fully programmed and funded in the CIP we adopted in May of 2021? Yeah, I'd have to go back and double check. I think Princess Anne was, and this moves it forward. I don't know that Betty F. was fully funded. Well, you go and check to find it was. Sure. I believe this brings it, Bayside was out in 31 to start construction, delivering in out in the 33s, 34 time frame by mind, it was out there, but it was way out there. So we're bringing that in. So I think the challenge that we have, and I'm trying to understand is, given the financial stress that kids, the stress that kids might not have at home, at school, they're having it at home when their families can't make ends meet and can't pay their rent, can't pay their utilities, all that stress factor. And we're raising taxes when no one is paying all their health insurance compensation. They're not enjoying that kind of a paternalistic, uh, and the city does it as well, so I'm not making that a bad thing. I'm just saying families aren't experiencing that kind of income protection at their homes. So what is the empirical value, the value added to the student who goes to the new school a year early compared to keeping the schedule like it was, having those cash assets that we provided, and and providing those either in compensation to employees where you say you're not competitive or return it to the taxpayer because they're dealing with issues today. Because the real question is the value added of acceleration of the student versus putting that money in the hands of people who can't make ends meet today. And I know someone must have made that assessment. And, and, <coughs> and, and I'm also curious as to 
knowing we are now knowing your new compensation challenges, would you say making sure the students who you say you're having trouble hiring the right teachers with the right qualifications, I'd like that answer to be, we're going to be able to hire the right teachers with the right qualifications and maybe deferring the construction cost, the construction start to the original schedule and putting those dollars into getting the right student who for that five years is going to get the education that the building doesn't provide. I'm just trying to understand that value choice that you made. Yeah, I think it probably comes down to this chart here in terms of the funding source for those construction dollars, which is not the same as the operational fund budget. I agree and with so that. the operational budget is where we would deal with employee compensation and we would need to figure out a way to redirect dollars that would come out of this in order to further delay construction projects um, and figure out how to redirect those dollars into the operating budget in order to achieve that. So our perspective would, would have been in this conversation that we would use these revenues for their intended purpose, which would be capital projects, and then the operating dollars for its intended purpose, which are the ongoing costs associated with the I would project. concur, except the dollars I'm referring to were the dollars that were the ending fund surplus of 2021 cash, which included an overperformance of revenues, $10.1 million from the state, and then, this, then there was the regular uh, ending fund balance that was just from under execution on both the city and the which came up to the 54.9 million. So that was out of our whole about hundred million dollar surplus at the end of last year budget year. So that was cash on February 1st. You asked us to deploy that cash to these projects. So that cash could easily in this budget process be redeployed because it didn't come from title one. It is, it was truly fungible dollars. And I mentioned at the time, I was surprised with your compensation issues that you weren't deploying any of those cash dollars to compensation. So they are reprogrammable. Now, I'm thinking they should go back to the taxpayers, but that's another issue. And that's, I don't want to engage you on that. I'm just trying to understand, since those dollars are fungible and you haven't really started any of that construction, so that other schedule was a valid way of execution, you know, what was the thought process that got you to say, now knowing you have a bigger compensation challenge than you had when you worked at the five-year forecast, and we both do, and you're telling us that because of it, you had a risk of not hiring the quality teachers you want, it would seem to me is that that would be the first and foremost thing, rather than construction, would be to have the best student, best teacher in the classroom. That's the, that's the trade-off I'm trying to understand. So I'll let Crystal uh, talk a little bit about the reversion funds and the, the use of those reversion funds and how they can be used. I think everybody understands those are one-time dollars and can't be redeployed over time. So if we were to invest those in compensation, we would then have to, we would essentially be creating a hole that we would have to come back and fill with future revenues. And as you can see up there again, re reversion is part of the strategy for school construction, but it is not the entirety of the strategy for con school construction. And so those are one-time dollars and those are projected reversion dollars that would be allocated to the CIP should we see those reversion dollars again? And of course, we anticipate we would because it's a continued goal of the board to, to um, spend down to about 2% of the overall budget because of contingencies that we're concerned about, like fuel costs this year, which have caught us off guard. I um, do understand if like, this could come back. I do understand that you retained all the programmed debt service when you got the cash. You held on to all that six million, all the programmed debt that was for those two schools. You held on and kept that, so you had net growth because you got cash, and you retained the borrowing, and re and kept that borrowing that was going to be used to fund those projects. That's the way they were fully funded. So I'm trying. So you really have a lot more flexibility, I think, than you're acknowledging. So and as Dr. Spence said, I mean, it is one-time funding, and I get what you're saying from the overperformance of revenues on both the city and school, and that created that, and we stay within that two percent. Sometimes it gets a little lower than that, it gets a little scary, but. That money has to be built into our base for compensation, and certainly to redirect these funds, that would be would you know you don't certainly never want to incur debt, and I know you know that that to to compensate your employees. So to use that part of that fifty four point nine, some of it was CIP, but some of it was also projects and things like that that are ongoing now that they've been encumbered, they're being spent, things are happening. But if we had said okay, we're going to take part of that money, which we can't guarantee we'll have this fiscal year or the next fiscal year or the next fiscal year. You might be able to do that one time, but you're going to create yourself 
a possible bad situation, especially if, if recession or, or we have bubbles or whatever. So you know what I mean? I mean, we, I don't need to tell you that, obviously. I, here, <laughs> obviously. Here's the point I'm making, because we're talking about a budget, and you're saying the most important person isn't the structure. No one got smart being in a building, you know. But is the teacher in the classroom, right? So if you're telling us that you have a problem and you don't think you're going to be able to hire the quality that the, the customer needs, and the parents want, because they're not the customer, it's the child, then, then what we have to have a discussion about is what does that mean and what obligation we take. Now, some of that money is recurring, so <coughs> it could be bonuses, but if you're telling me that you're running the risk, a serious risk was the word that you use, serious, then we shouldn't let a serious risk go unaddressed. So that means in the out years we have an obligation, then we know we've got a bill to pay. But if you're telling me that this is the trade-off, to my view is the public's going to say buildings can wait. You know, I'd rather have, be able to have a tax cut than a, built, a new building. I'm just sharing with you a, a candidate. Well, the tax cut is a different conversation. I know, that's not with you. It's with us. Right. That's a different conversation entirely. For us, the difference is one-time dollars allocated to the CIP versus ongoing costs that are in the operating budget. And I, I don't know how to be any clearer about that. The costs that we're talking about for the serious issue that we have of teacher compensation are ongoing dollars, and if we, I mean, every you know every one percent we we put into that is one percent we've got to find every year from this point moving forward, or else we're making cuts to employee compensation. My point is, if you hire the person that you can get, but isn't the person that you want, the only person who's paying the price for that is every student, as long as that person's in the system, by your own c comments. So what it really sees there ought to be a conversation about is the if we don't get more money from the state, then we'd have to say we're willing to change the funding formula to make that happen. But I don't want to say we're building buildings and then put teachers that we really say we wish we couldn't have hired in the building to teach our kids. It just seems to be reverse priorities. Uh, it's well, a more different conversation, yeah, I'm, I'm, but it is a serious conversation. No, I agree. It's a very serious uh, conversation around employee conversation, uh, uh, compensation. I just disagree that you can combine those two and say that buildings you, you can just stop the construction process and take that money and put it into compensation. I just don't think you can. Well, then I now, if the conversation is, well, we don't want to invest in buildings, and what we would rather do is deal with tax issues and not give the schools funding for buildings, that's a separate conversation that city council and the school board and the public ought to have. But our problem with compensation is an ongoing problem, and it is a significant issue. Just so, for context for the council, we were 100 teachers short at the beginning of this school year. We remain 100 teachers short today. Every time we hire a teacher, we lose a teacher. We have the same problem that's happening over at the city. We have 150 uh, non-instructional staff short, and we remain non-competitive in many of those areas. You all are having the same problems. We looked at our bus drivers, and our bus drivers, you know, they have a CDL. They can go out. They can make $20 an hour driving for anybody, and we're paying them $16 an hour. So we've just had that conversation with the school board about how to address that challenge. So we, ha we do have, and I don't want to minimize, we have significant challenges. We also have significant infrastructure challenges and significant building needs. And I recognize we have to balance those. So what we're trying to do is address the building needs with one-time funds and address our other needs with operational dollars that come out of the revenue sharing formula. And I think that that's the, the one we want to keep looking at. And I, I would welcome a conversation about adjusting the revenue sharing formula if it's going to help us. But you all have the same problem. And what we've got to figure out is how to grow more revenue for all of us and continue to maintain our focus on that revenue sharing formula and making sure that the, the, the money that comes in is well spent and in our case, that it is prioritized for compensation, which was the focus of this presentation. Our real challenge is the taxpayers can't afford the bill we're giving them. Well, I understand. Program. And, of course, it, you know, we, uh, we're very proud of the, the public schools. And I think our community is very proud of the public schools. And I think if you ask them, then they'd be willing to support our teachers and understand the challenges we're facing. Okay, thank you. That was a good conversation. Anybody else? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, David Trimmer, our director of agriculture, will present on the proposed budget for his department. Hey, David, how are you? How are we doing, council? Appreciate you having me today. 
Uh, I know we're a little bit behind time, so I will do my best to keep you, keep us going. Make sure this thing is working right. Yes. Uh, again, I'm David Trimmer, Agriculture Director. I've been here since 2008, and uh, we have nine FTEs that encompasses four departments, and you guys are familiar with them, the Director's Office, the Agriculture uh, Reserve Program Office, Farmer's Market, and our Virginia Cooperative Extension Office. Uh, in the Virginia, we have nine FTEs, but in the Virginia Cooperative Extension, we have an additional eight staff. We have five agents, uh, and we, we're familiar with them, the Horticulture Agent, the 4-H Agent, the, the ag agent and the, uh, the unit coordinator who's also the financial agent and we have a training agent and then we have three program assistants they they work in areas of snap ed uh, a lot of federal programs a lot of state programs related to older citizens uh, they're below the an income level uh, children that are below an income level and a combination of the two uh, a lot of times it's grandparents uh, running the family I my Next chart, oops, I'm sorry, move that, okay. Gives you the programmatic budget, just gives you a pie chart. Uh, the one I'll point out there is the 990, that is the Stormwater General Government Capital Project. We use that money that is used by Public Works down south to work on our canals and ditches. Uh, we spend a, uh, Mrs. Henley and Public Works team, and including myself, spend a lot of time uh, working on drainage, working on a ditch. We were down there last week on three different projects. Uh, we have a great relationship, and our public works team, along with the contractors, do a great job. Uh, the operating budget is, is, is basically the, the four departments I told you about. Uh, it's, we're asking for $40,392. The operating budget that you see, the, the proposed 90, 987, does not reflect the income that we derive from the farmer's market, which is about 30 percent. So that would offset what, we, what we're asking for throughout the year. So in essence, our budget is 297,000 and change. Uh, it's, been, it's been that way through the years. And all, my personal goal is make sure we have our revenues ex exceed what the market costs to run. And we've done a good job, an excellent job, that since two, at least 2008. I am going to go to the next one. This is the overhead, the, the operating budget for ARP. It shows the 990 that was proposed several years ago. Uh, and we are looking at the 13.122 million down. That's a, almost a $7 million increase. Uh, and my next, I won't read to you. I know we don't care to be, that's not important to be read, but, uh, per, but the 134 uh, on the economic development side, that is 2020. We have finalized just last week the 2021 number. It is 170 million for, for uh, there. The big increase is related to the commodities market, which we're well aware of. Our yields are up by our farmers on, and co commodities are corn, wheat, and soybean. Our yields are better, and the price was a lot better. So when, when all, you know, kind of the home run scenario, and we've all seen that in the past because we, we know what the grain farmers. We also know that we had a pretty good spike in equine, a lot of money being spent on the horse farms, and, th and that includes expenses. Uh, with the big one on uh, West Landing Road is, is doing a lot of modern, modernization of that facility. A buyer from New York came in. That is in the Ag Reserve Program. There is being nothing done related to, to, to housing or anything. This is just all capital improvements on site. Uh, very, very, very pleasing to see. Uh, I will touch on... We, you know, we, we, we're going, I'm not going to read it to you, and there's the 300000 annual revenue. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on. We, we rely on a lot of volunteers. we got nine employees, basically. So we rely on, on a lot of volunteers, whether it's the Master Garden Program, the 4-H, the, the ag, uh, ag Educational Program at the R, uh, RHC, whether it's Camp Millionaire, all our camps. Uh, we do pesticide certification. We do well water. And the pesticide certification is, is, is businesses. It's city, city staff. It's homeowners. We do well water testing. We do soil testing programs. Uh, we have the kids program at the RHC. Uh, we, you know, I, the, the, the lot of the schools that go on for the farmers, uh, the pre-plant, the post-plant on strawberries, all of them do a great, all do wonderful things. Uh, it is strawberry season. We will be sending this out to all our libraries. In hard copy, this is our map of all where everything's at as it relates to strawberries. We also post it, so we'll do a news release, 
And the way we tell everybody what's going on with agriculture is we do a newsletter. The newsletter is done quarterly out front. It's not to tell you what we did do. It's to tell you what's going on as it relates to ag. This goes to the communities. It goes to our libraries. It goes to our citizens. It, hopefully you guys all look at it. It's pretty thick. Uh, it was the way I came up with in 2000, way back when I was with Smithfield, was a way to communicate with all the multilingual employees I had in, had in the plant. Instead, uh, in this case, we did it to let everybody know what's going on with agriculture. And it kind of sets the bar for this quarter. So with that, I'll, <coughs> I'll close and take any questions. I know it was quick, but I'm a little behind for what, trying to keep you guys on target. Okay, any questions? I have one question. Mr. Sir. Jones. If you, and you, you say your yields are better. Are you talking about in terms of product, production? or Bushel. Bushel of product. For example... Corn was up 24 bushels per acre uh, on average. Uh, soybeans was 8 bushels, and wheat was up 22 bushels. And we know what the wheat market's doing based on the issues going over in, in Ukraine and Russia and places like that. That trend's probably going to hold strong. We've seen recently what's going on with corn. You know, uh, and we have drought-like conditions out west in our, in our own, country, in our own uh, USA. And Ethanol is going to, we're going to increase ethanol production and add, add that to help offset some of the rising cost on fuel. So that's what I'm referring to. Uh, price wise, corn's up a buck fifty a bushel, three thirty one a per bushel increase, and a buck fifty six on wheat. Is that so the last thirty days or last week or that's a survey we did. Uh, we just did as part of this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big time. Season. Yeah, it's up. It's yeah. I mean, just look at the commodity markets. If you I mean, if you want to get speculative. I mean, that's what farmers do anyway. But, I mean, there's people buying and selling commodities, and they're, they're not even farmers. But, uh, yeah. Comments? Okay, anybody We all else? good? I guess that's good news, huh? Yeah. I mean, it, in, in reality, the problem is the input cost is going up. You're, 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 all your input costs, because you've got grain drying, so all LP gas, whether it's your you, – you guys all know what your costs are doing. You can't even, you guys know, you can't even, it was hard finding Roundup. Don't get David started. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, <laughs> sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I, I felt the buzzer. Yeah. <laughs> Will you just show some passion for your job? Oh, man. You know, Mayor, I'm following you because I know whenever you're around, you you, you drive that passion. Thank oh, y'all. Y'all have a great day. Hey, that was a good <laughs> response. That was yeah. diplomatic. It, anybody yeah. wants to come see me, we're, we'll go down south. Thank <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. Moving on. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, Director Spinolas will come and give you a presentation on the proposed budget for the aquariums. Hello again. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of city council. Thank you for having me to share with you our operating budget for the Virginia Aquarium. Mm. As you know, the city is very fortunate to have the Virginia Aquarium Foundation support of your city aquarium. And in this regard, I'm joined today by our chair, Sal DeBarro. As I mention each time that I share an item with you, this is your aquarium. And the foundation provides the support to you in terms of funding for our animals, our exhibits, our educational programs, and our research and conservation initiatives. Today you will note in this presentation that this nonprofit entity will be transferring over a million dollars to support your aquarium. This does not include the additional $3 million each year that the, aquarium, that the foundation spends to support the aquarium. And as you will note, when you do visit the aquarium, I like to make our presentations fun yet educational. And today I'm joined by Chris Equals, Carrie Ann Flanagan, and Chris Plant, our newly hired VP, VP of Animal Care. And they've brought three of our animal ambassadors with us, a blue-tongued skink named Zula, and two adorable Tenerek named Madeline and Elise. And I thought you would enjoy seeing these, and hopefully our viewing audience would enjoy seeing these. How do they see? <laughs> oh, yeah, that, they don't really need eyes. <laughs> and apparently they are going to steal the show today. <laughs> oh, look at them. So cute. Are those marsupials? Uh, no. uh, they look they're like possums. Right? Right <laughs> look at his so little nose. Yeah, they're really cool. So they're from the island of Madagascar. 
Well, hello. So David has bushels of corn and I have animals. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for not bringing a crocodile. We did not bring the crocodile, Mayor. <laughs> but you're welcome to visit our two croc crocodiles anytime. <laughs> we have wonderful staff. <laughs> All right, thank y'all. <laughs> thank you, Vice Mayor. I think, uh, Cynthia, you started a new trend. Uh, become, uh, you know, on a budget hearing. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Yeah, Duhaney yeah, always yeah. warns me, are you going to bring an animal? So I yeah, said, yes, I think sir. We're have a new trend <laughs> department head. All right. <laughs> All right. So let me briefly uh, share with you our departmental budget. So briefly, we have roughly 128 FTEs, and our operating budget is $14.5 million. As you can imagine, to run an aquarium, you have lots of items to purchase and fund. And if you wanted to guess, you'd be correct if you guessed that our biggest expense is animal care. Let me click to the next slide to show you the actual numbers. For expenditures, a few brief changes that you will note here. First, we reorganized our staff, and one staff member is now reporting in administration rather than marketing. Also, we've asked for an additional $300,000 moving forward to help offset some of the costs associated with our changing exhibits. And this is also reflected in that first line under administration. However, I will note that these increases are funded by revenues. And I will also point out under the Aquarium Foundation section, you'll note that million dollars transferred over to the city. So let's talk about revenues. You will note that we expect to see an increase in revenues during the next fiscal year. Attendance is conservatively being projected at 542,000 visitors for FY23, which is roughly a 5% increase from FY22, but still below our pre-pandemic 2019 numbers. I would like to clarify that these are direct revenues, which do not factor in our approximate $265 million of economic impact that the aquarium has on our Virginia Beach economy every year. And we hope to earn over 85% of our operating budget for the next year. And in fact, you'll note on this slide at the very bottom that we expect this year to use $1.8 million of general fund money However, as of today's date, with our revenues being so strong this current year, we don't expect to use any of that general fund contribution this current fiscal year. We do plan to restore some positions that were eliminated in previous budget cuts, and we're adding a few new positions as well. I will note two of these positions will be fully funded by the Aquarium Foundation. In terms of major changes and initiatives, I'm pleased to share with you that we opened the Darden Marine Animal Conservation Center this past year, and our South Building has continued to have construction delays, but we hope to open it later this summer. And we are continuing with our time ticket model. As I mentioned a few months ago, not only do the direct a few moments ago, not only do the direct revenues we receive support this important attraction, we are generating over $265 million of economic impacts to the Virginia Beach economy. Moreover, we're an educational resource for our K through 12 students, and we've partnered with numerous colleges and universities on a variety of programs. In terms of initiatives underway, thanks to the Shuttered Venues grant that we received from the federal government, we are beginning the next phase in our journey. A feasibility study is underway for our planned expansion thanks to this funding. But let me start with the next sad slide to provide some context. We received this sad review last week, which was perfect timing for this presentation today. Let me share what uh, Mr. Michael Miller, who gave us two stars, said. We've been several times in the past and have absolutely loved the experience. However, this most recent time fell short. The first area had only one crow in a cage and a small tank with some fish in it. Not exactly an attention grabber. 
The other tanks throughout the aquarium were not full of animals as, they, as we had previously seen, and several key exhibits were not on display, such as the Stingray touch tank and the South Building. Overall, we paid $90 and we were finished in 30 minutes. This was very disappointing and we probably won't be back for some time. While we are excited about the South Building's opening and having all new exhibits in that building, we know that our main building is 36 years old and many of the exhibits, including the shark tank, the turtle tank, and the seal tank have far exceeded their useful lives. Many of our exhibits are down for repair and we are looking to the future on how we can add new and exciting things while at the same time repair and replace our old and outdated areas. Hence, as I mentioned in my previous slide, we are currently underway with a feasibility study for improvements. The picture you see here provides a general conceptual view of what we could do in the future. Building a new building not only adds excitement and new things for our visitors to experience, it also provides the necessary space to relocate the animals that are in their current habitats into the new building. This then allows us to renovate the older areas into new and exciting exhibits. Without this expansion, we would un be unable to renovate the existing building since we would not have a location to house our current collection of animals over a three-year construction period. Additionally, if we found a location for these animals, which is unlikely, closing the aquarium for a massive renovation for approximately three years would negatively impact the city's economy. Remember the $265 million each year that we generate, this would be gone. That's why this expansion allows us to remain open and continue to generate revenue. So, our ambition plan, ambitious plan is to work with Zoo Advisors, a firm that we recently hired to do a feasibility study on what could this new building look like and what other types of exhibits we can imagine for the renovated spaces. <coughs> so stay tuned for more items to come. And I will end with a thank you to each of you for your continued support of the Virginia Aquarium. And we certainly look forward to next fiscal year and further beyond. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with Rosemary. Congratulations on all of your accomplishments. Oh, thank and, you. And always, you and, and your board with Sal, uh, having vision to go to the next level, you, you never disappoint us. So thank you. And I just wanted to mention, uh, it was really amazing that you had the anti-venom for that gentleman in in Richmond that had the snake bite, that they came here to be able to save his life, and that was really, really amazing. Just wanted to. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, we were, we were happy to provide that. Uh, poison control called us, and we keep that on hand for our animals and for our staff, and we were happy to provide that. It was amazing. What? Uh, Linwood. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, first off, uh, Thank you, Sal, and the board for all you do for the aquarium. Um, it really takes a volunteer private sector effort to really make this what it is. And Cynthia, I would um, suggest that you get a hold of this Michael Miller and <laughs> when we get the South Building open, give him a free pass because I think he will be so amazed by that that he'll be back again and again. I was very amazed when I took the tour and uh, now we need to move on to the other building. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Okay, Sabrina. Hi, good afternoon. Always good to see you. You you are another leader within our department that has so much passion for what you do, and I appreciate that and appreciate your board and, and staff and all that they do. Um, I would just like to highlight the educational piece that the aquarium serves within our city. Uh, we just heard a presentation from um, our superintendent and the chair uh, for our, our public schools and education is just so invaluable and we just have to do um, what we have to do to ensure that we continue the excellence of education in our city um, but I would like to say I was very impacted by um, the tour that I took of that new building that you opened especially the exhibits that focused on flooding and one of the guides share with me that uh, students from public schools come from the <coughs> city of Virginia Beach and they actually, you know, uh, learn uh, from 
that exhibit. And um, there are other areas within the building that host uh, students as well. And so could you elaborate and share on just how important the edu educational piece is uh, for the Absolutely. Equilibrium. Sure. So every year, um, just from K through 12 on non-pandemic years, we have about 50,000 school children um, that visit the aquarium. And then in addition to that, the foundation funds our outreach program. So we're actually going out to schools throughout Hampton Roads with animals going into school systems um, to share animals as well as STEM education. So that's a very important important component um, for our school system. I think the most proud um, item that I have this year to share with you is that we've partnered with Virginia Beach City Public Schools with their high school environmental program. And so we are hosting um, interns. Um, the students spend 150 to 260 hours throughout the school year um, paired with our staff um, learning um, and growing and working on projects at the aquarium. So they come as part of their school day um, at the aquarium. So we're really excited about that. Um, of course, we have summer camps. We have a whole host of programs where we um, host children. Um, the part that I'm also proud of is that the foundation funds um, Access Aquarium. And so that's a program where if you're a school child and you can't afford to come, we actually pay for you to come. And the, the foundation gives that money to the city to pay for those children to come to the aquarium if they can't afford to come. So that's a really wonderful program um, that we've um, fostered and our foundation has grown over the years. <coughs> I think it's excellent, and I even remember um, being told about how children come, and if they are interested in maybe being a, perhaps a veterinarian, they can't really see how, you know, it would actually be um, to become a real veterinarian. And if they like it, I just think it's just the, you know, of course, overall, the aquarium uh, adds such uh, in, of a benefit and investment, uh, making us a destination. Uh, place for everyone to come and visit, but uh, without saying, um, you know, just the p educational piece is really phenomenal. And if you haven't been by to see that actual simulation about flooding, it's it's so realistic. Uh, and we talk about flooding on this body all the time, and just to see how, you know, that display. And, and the educational piece is just, is phenomenal. Thank oh, you thank for what you. you do. Oh, thank you. You really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Mr. John. I saw your commercial on YouTube this morning on a finance, the, with the Komodo dragon in it, which one I'm talking okay. about. Okay. was very nice. Oh, thank very, you. Very, very effective. I just, it came thank on, you. it's one of those ads that runs, it doesn't allow you to skip. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very well done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, you have made Virginia Beach a true destination. And, you know, yeah, we got an ocean and we got a town center. We got a lot of things. We got Stumpy Lake, but we have the aquarium too. And a lot of people come to Virginia Beach and it, it doesn't have to be a rain day. Uh, you know, people like coming there because you give us a variety <clears throat> that is, you know, really when a kid sees the aquarium for the first time, they're going to take that memory for life. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for you what you continue to do. And, uh, you know, since I've been here, that place has been doing nothing but improving. Oh. Way to go. Well, thank you for your support and the council's support and Mr. Duhaney's support. We really couldn't do it without each one, every one of you. All right. Thanks right, so thank much. You. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Not that I know of. Yes. Okay. okay. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, Director Eileen Smith from Human Services will present on the proposed budget hey, for Human Services. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me, everyone. And Mr. Duhaney, too. Um, <laughs> don't want to forget you. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Human Services budget this year. And I don't have any animals. I do have some wonderful staff with me, though. Angie Hicks, Denise Henderson, and Dee Bolden in the back there. So I did bring some of my wonderful staff here. Um, we have in the Department of Human Services 1,194 city full-time employers. Oh, I'm the clicker person? Okay. Thank you. 
1,191 full-time staff in four divisions and a $135 million budget. Now we also have contract staff and part-time staff that we add to this, so we're about 1,500 strong in reality. As you know, we have had some challenges with vacancies this year that we have tried to fill. We have a hiring bonus program, thank you very much for helping to support that, that has brought in 53 staff. Uh, so that's a, that's a good number since last October, November when we started the program. But we're still challenged with filling all of these vacancies. And when you're challenged like that, who's picking up the, the load? Well, it's the staff that are continuing to be there. So we have a lot of staff that are working overtime or actually uh, you know, doing double duty, wearing multiple hats. Everyone in the agency is doing a very big lift right now to make sure that our programs keep running and that our services keep going. And so I do want to say you know, a big thank you to them today, but also a big thank you to you for providing them with a raise last year and that bonus. It was really appreciated. I heard a lot about that from the staff members, so thank you very much, all of you, for doing that. Okay, and in this uh, slide, I should also mention the four divisions, there's 60 programs across 27 locations in the city. So we're huge. We're across a lot of different locations. Okay, the budget for BHDS and administration is about 78 million of this. As you can see in this slide, the developmental services amount of this budget is the biggest. It's 37% at 28 million. Behavioral health is 25 million, 33%. And then the other parts of the budget are a little bit smaller. But we added in the uh, administration part to the BHDS side just for purposes of this slide. That would include my CQI, HR, IT. Social services is a $56 million budget. Biggest parts would be your Children's Services Act, your children's services, that's where your child welfare is, investigations, ongoing, foster care, benefits, eligibility, and adult services, that's also where we have adult protective services. We do have JDC in there at 11%, and just some other um, employment services, that'd be your TANF and VIEW. Okay, so our budget is going up just a little bit this year. Uh, we did go up in staff, as you're aware of, because the, the state provided us with some different program amounts for, such as the Marcus crisis program, forensic services, our PSH program, and peer services. So we did get some staff from the state this year, as well as some ARPA funds, which helped us out. And within here, we also have, of course, your VRS part, your additional part for staff, and um, the big part of it would be, though, the state, the state lift there. OK, I put this slide in here so that I can um, tell you a little bit about our strategic plan. I like to talk about this plan because it's a very active plan for us. We put this plan in place way back uh, six years ago, really, almost at this point. But in 2018, we refreshed it. And everything that we do that's going to come after this slide in our major initiatives and things that are uh, programs and services that we do are going to fall into one of these categories. We make sure of that. We talk to our boards about it every month. Where does this program fit? Where does this service fit in our strategic plan? and we're refreshing it all the time. So our plan goes through 2023. A good portion of it is gonna fall into integration and access to services. We wanna make sure our citizens have the best access to service, the most timely access to service. So a good portion is gonna fall in there. But we do a lot around community engagement. We don't wanna forget that. Our prevention folks are out there frequently doing events and doing other um, engagement activities in our, in our um, community. And then talent acquisition and development is critically important, especially for clinical positions. You want to make sure that they are continuing to get that education and uh, be able to go to conferences and see some of the innovative therapies and things that are going on. OK, so the social services side, some of the changes and initiatives that we have there is, I'm not sure that everyone is aware, but we serve about 92,000 citizens of Virginia Beach. So if you think we have about 460,000 citizens in the, in the city, we're serving almost a quarter of them in the Human Services Department, just in social services and the benefits area. They're getting some combination, whether it's Medicaid or SNAP, which is your supplemental nutrition program. So 92,000. The staff in this area 
have been challenged, of course, with vacancies. A lot of them have done a lot of overtime. They have worked incredibly hard to achieve what is remarkable, and I'm going to show you right here our March statistics. What they call level three agencies would be your big agencies in the state of Virginia. So you're talking Fairfax, <laughs> Prince William, you know, Henrico, Chesterfield, Richmond, places like this. And we ranked in March with the vacancies and the number of applications that we had to process third highest for meeting non-expedited target. Non-expedited target is within 30 days you're processing that application. Expedited is within seven days, so you're moving very fast on those. And we ranked second, so we were only behind Fairfax and Prince William. And when I say to you Fairfax has like a whole training um, academy, they have a lot more staff than we do, and they do a lot around this to make sure they don't miss anything in any of these applications. We're working on that. We're hiring a little bit more in terms of our training staff. But this is phenomenal, so I wanted to share that with you because you should be really proud, and I'm really proud of the staff and what they've done. Okay, so in child welfare, we did have 37 adoptions in 2021. We're always working towards permanency. We always want those children to find that permanent home. So um, 37, and we already did three this year. So all the time, that is a key uh, initiative for the staff that are working in this area to make sure that they're working that through the court process and working with the families to make sure we find the best families and the best fit for these kids so they can have a permanent home. 313 kids were still followed post-adoption. What do we do? We see them at least annually, but lots times more often than that. We're helping them through the FAPT process. We're helping them through any crisis or therapy services that they need. So we're always following these kids. 177 kids are still in our foster care program. And 29 kids are in our fostering futures, which is the 18 to 21 year old range. In adult and aging, we have 237 active APS cases. APS is Adult Protective Services. So if there's a fear that they may be exploited, neglected, or somehow abused, we're involved for your senior citizens, as well as your disabled individuals who are adults. 871 or 878 clients are receiving guardianship, and 61 are receiving companion services. Okay, the mobile food pantries. This was an initiative that actually came from council. You uh, dedicated some money to the Southeastern Food Pantry, and then they worked with us to put on these big events, these big mobile food pantry events. And uh, it's every time when we do these, you know, we pray for no rain, of course, but every time when we do these, um, it's really the leaders and I that are out there. We have the rest of the staff can join us if they want to and if their jobs will allow it. But for the most part, it's the leaders and I out there and a lot of other help from police, public works, uh, the amphitheater, lends us the amphitheater, and we have a ton of volunteers. It takes really quite a lot of people to run one of these. The last one was in March, March 29th. It was freezing cold that day, if you recall. <laughs> that was the day, the like coldest day of March. Um, but we served 1,530 people, 1,530 households. And that means 60 pounds of food per household. So that's just one of these events. Most of them are somewhere between 1,400 families and 1,700 families. Overall, over 8,564 households have been served this year, which is really great. And it's a, it, the f folks who come through there are the most kind and thankful people. They truly are. They're, and they're very thankful to all of you, too. They want to make sure that you know how thankful they are that we're doing this as a city. And it's not done in every city. OK, so BHDS, Behavioral Health Developmental Services. What are some of the new services this year? Well, we opened up an office-based opiate treatment. That was back in November, actually, but it really lifted off in 2021. Marcus Alert went live in December, as well as our mobile crisis hubs. In the Marcus Alert, we're partnering with uh, 911, 311, 911 for the most part, to make sure that the 911 operators know that they can defer these calls that are behavioral health emergencies to us. And about 150 calls since we went live have been deferred, so police didn't have to go out to these these locations, and they could go right to a behavioral health expert. So we're helping out with the entire public safety and public service here by deferring and working with our 911 to do that Marcus Alert program. We are one of five in the state. I believe you're aware of this. And so um, that's pretty remarkable. Angie is over this program. 
and she has done an incredible amount of work to help lift it off, so I'm very appreciative to her. In the crisis hubs, we were able to lift them off with actually the pathway staff. So I do have, that's, that's the news that is actually rather sad in my presentation. We have not been able to open pathways, crisis services again. We closed them in November, didn't have enough nurses. I um, provided a little bit of information to you on that. And we still haven't been able to hire the nurses. The nursing and the medical component of our agency is extremely competitive. Very hard to hire these folks. So we're not quite there yet. So those folks are working in the crisis services. We moved all the staff around so that they'd, they'd have a position. And um, that's really helped to move this program forward. Expanded services, permanent supportive housing got 50 more slots. We were actually asked to take more slots because we do such a remarkable job. So now we have 122 slots total. And so they looked at Virginia Beach and they said, you're doing phenomenal with the first group. We know you need more staff to do this. We're going to give you more staff and we're going to give you more slots. So again, a credit to our, our team, our staff, and our leaders here in this agency. Forensic discharge, we got three more positions to help with that, with folks coming out of the jail. And drug court has expanded. We got a grant, and we have expanded that. So we're going to be able to serve more people through the drug court process. OK, so this, this is our ask. This is really what we want to talk about a little bit today. And I'm going to have Angie tell you just a little bit about it as well. So Angie's uh, job actually is over in the P6 building. Her location is there. This is a picture of the P6 building. We have all four of the floors, but we don't have the fifth floor. The fifth floor has always been some other agency or someone else has occupied it. What we'd like to do is move over another location where Elise is coming to, move those services into the fifth floor, and then have like a one-stop shop where we add more services. People can just go up and down whatever they need in one day as opposed to going to some of our other locations. I mentioned we have a lot of locations. And that can be difficult on people for transportation. So this is what we'd like to propose to you. It will help with the one-stop shop, but also increase our engagement and just our continuity of care. So I'm going to invite Angie up here to tell you a little story about one of the clients. This is one of probably 300 stories she could tell you about. Um, but I'll let you, I'll let you tell them about um, one person in particular, just to kind of give you a picture of this. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to share a story with you, a story about Lane. Lane is a 26-year-old woman who, as a child, experienced severe sexual and physical abuse. That trauma prevented her from developing adaptive coping skills and forming the type of healthy, trusting relationships that we all were fortunate enough to form. In addition, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And over the years, she's had severe episodes of depression and mania, distorted thought patterns, and thoughts of ending her life. With the lack of treatment and ongoing stressors in Lane's life, her symptoms worsened. She began to self-medicate with opioids and alcohol. She was disenfranchised from her family, and eventually she became homeless. She was living on the streets. She was going in between shelters. Um, so at a point in her life where things were very rough for her, she was hospitalized three times over the last couple of years, but she never followed up with outpatient care upon discharge. When she finally came through same-day access at Pembroke 6, she was coming out of her fourth hospitalization after a severe overdose and attempt to end her life. The same-day access clinician completed her assessment and clearly identified complex needs for Lane. Before addressing her trauma and the need for therapy, we needed to get her with a physician for medication to stabilize her symptoms, and we needed to help address some of her most basic needs. These are things that we sometimes take for granted, but many of the people who seek help with us do not have their basic needs met. So we referred her to crisis management, housing supports, and case management services. Currently, those three services are located at different sites. 
Now, we all know when we try to navigate the health care system, it can be difficult. And we would all most likely prefer to have most of our services in one location so that you can go from point A to point B very efficiently. But for someone like Lane, who was in crisis and feeling hopeless in her life and quite frankly questioning whether our services could make a difference for her, it truly had an impact not having services in one location. And in fact, we had difficulty re-engaging with her after that first appointment. It took a team of people looking for her. So the Pembroke 6 expansion is an opportunity for us to streamline some of these core mental health services. And for Lane, what that would have meant is that after that first appointment, that intake clinician could walk her up to the fifth floor, put her in touch with a crisis stabilization clinician, a peer <coughs> specialist, and a housing specialist, and they could start working on some of those basic needs right away. And in addition to just meeting those needs, another thing that's important to mention to council is that that provides a rapid engagement. It's so important for this, this population because it builds trust and it also builds value in the services that we can offer and that's what keeps people coming back when they're sick and engaging in services long enough that they can get well. People who are symptomatic and struggling with their basic needs are not able to navigate a fragmented service system. So this opportunity to integrate services at P6 will allow people like Lane to get the help that they need faster um, and to avoid any type of delays in care which could lead to negative outcomes. So I will point out before I, um, before I leave that Lane was just one of 1,100 individuals that sought our help last year and came through same-day access. Many more stories like this. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. Thank you. <coughs> all right, any questions at all? I don't have a question, I just have a yeah, comment. Yeah. And I know Michael's been out there, and I congratulate him for doing that at the food bank when I've been out there, but that has been, I have heard feedback from people in churches and around the community, what a great program that is. And that was the sad news that came from the agricultural department, because the bigger food inflation is to come. Yeah. What we think we've seen is a, a small measure of what we're going to see going forward. And so your department, I appreciate all you do to make sure that those families, uh, at least to some extent, lessen the, the stress of not being able to have food at their home. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, they're very thankful. And, and they know that council was a part of this too. And that we're one of the cities that, that does this, that there are very few actually. Even when our state office came down from Richmond, she visited one time, she said, we're not doing this in Richmond. Congrats, you know, so thank you very much for that. And Mr. Bellucci is out there. He's, he, he's almost directing traffic with us, you know, so he's just a full on partner with it. So thank you for that too. Okay, Barbara, then Mike, and then the traffic director. The, uh, <laughs> the expansion is underway, or is that something that we have to approve? That would be for your approval. Okay, so not that's, underway. That's your number one ask yes. this year. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And what would be the timeline on uh, having it uh, in place? Um, it well, you know, if it, <laughs> I would say probably six months to a year. I mean, it's going to take a little while. Um, and so we haven't put it that far because we're waiting to see, you know, where this lies with you. And then after that, I would say any of our expansions have taken around six months because it takes a little while. We have to renovate, make it fit for us, and then move. But it, it actually, for this purpose, if we were going to do it, we would have to put it in place very quickly to get that other lease, move out of that other lease. So it would be, you know, within that six-month period. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael and then Linwood. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for being here and for your presentation. And you're very kind to, to say that about me. I have the chance to, I've had a chance to visit distribution, uh, but certainly, actually, you're the one directing traffic, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, that the director of human services is the one. But I see you there, uh, and, your, and your team, too, senior leadership on the ground, um, doing everything that needs to be done to make sure those programs are successful. So I want to compliment you on that. and. Uh, I think it's uh, really just impressive and remarkable operation that you're right is supported by Public Works.
Police Department. Last time I was there, I saw incredible volunteers from the U.S. Navy right. um, doing some heavy lifting, which, which I'm sure was welcome relief. So it is a great partnership, and it's something that we're all very proud of, and I want to thank you for that. And I just do want to yeah. say hi to Angie and Dee and your other staff members here. I'm sorry your name escaped me for the moment. Denise. But Denise, good to see you. And thank you for being here and for the incredible work you do. You know, the, this portfolio represents our most underserved um, most at-risk um, residents. And um, it's because of the work that you do and also our nonprofit partners and many others that Virginia Beach is consistently ranked as the most caring city. Um, and I think that's a reflection of the investment that council and it's really just our whole community makes in terms of providing services and um, attention and compassion to people who are in need um, for whatever reason. So having said all that, I do have a couple questions. Um, uh, one is related to the Pathway Center, and, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of the fact of the challenges that you're, that you're having there. And, um, you know, addiction is an element of mental health. As you know, that's something that has been very important to me. Um, and providing services to people who are facing uh, issues or related to substance use and, and uh, addiction and all of those elements of mental wellness is critical um, to avoid things like in interaction with law enforcement and then the spiral that results from that from there so anyway that's a long way of saying it's really important we get that center up and running as from what I understand I don't know a lot about the program there but yeah. I know addiction <clears throat> services are <throat> crucial to the health of our community so how do you think we can I mean, what's the next step? So Angie and I have been working on a plan, a recruitment plan for really the whole program, but in particular the nursing, because that's we have to have nurses there 24-7. And so we need a robust cadre of nurses. We can't just have one or two nurses trying to carry that torch. And so um, we're working on that, and we plan to put something forth to be a little bit more competitive. Uh, I would compliment uh, City Manager Duhaney, who has been incredibly supportive of everything that I've done. Thank you so much. And everything that I put forth in terms of, of just being more competitive in this field, and especially in the medical area. Uh, as you know, we're in competition with not only the other CSBs in the area, but Centera and places like this. And Centera, you know, recently had announced $125 million in bonuses and incentives to their staff. So, so we're always trying to do what we can to, to be that, that employer that, uh, that we want to be and that is competitive. I think you talked a little bit about the crisis centers. Um, and can you describe kind of how you have um, uh, adjusted your operations to compensate or maybe possibly mitigate the impact of closing the pathway center? So let's say someone in crisis or um, a family member is seeking the help that they would um, be needing from the Pathway Center, but and they're connecting with the city. So what happens then? Since the Pathway, you would normally direct them to the Pathway Center. Right. Since that's not open, now what? Um, well, it depends on the level and the intensity of services that they need. So our same day access that Angie mentioned, where about 1,100 people have come through this past year, usually that's the gateway to do that assessment, to do that evaluation, to figure out, oh, you, you may need something more intense than what we can provide. And then we would be referring them to an inpatient place, an inpatient um, opportunity, such as VB Psych or somewhere like that. Uh, but if it's something outpatient, something that we can manage, then we're going to pull them in through our services and put them into our clinic. I think one of the, and I thank you for that, I don't know what the answer is. I, you know, I'm not asking these questions with any specific outcome in mind, <laughs> other than that when people are seeking help, they need it right then right. and there. And so, you know, the fact that we have uh, some challenges, and, and maybe there, I mean, I actually have little confidence that there are other resources in the community to, to, that would compensate for, for our lack, because everyone's facing the same right. challenges. But, um, you know, maybe there are some creative ways we can work around it. I don't know, I'm happy to, to uh, you know, be supportive of any ideas that you have, but it's just, I think it's so critical that we connect people with the services they need at the moment that they're seeking them. Otherwise we lose them and then they're gonna end up in jail or worse or do. So um, anyway, uh, it's true. been on my mind and it's something that I, I have, I'm concerned about and I think we need to 
address as soon as possible. So thank you very much. Correct. And Michael, Correct. thank you for your passion in this regard. Absolutely. Linwood. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I want to go back to that consolidation um, discussion you were having, because that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of explain to me what would need to happen for that to happen? You're talking about the P6? Yeah. Okay. P6. So we have programs that are over at one of our other locations, obviously, and one of and that location's lease is, is up in December. <clears throat> and so what we would look to do is move over everything that's in there and put it on the fifth floor, but also create a way that we can have hoteling there for staff. Because we're expanding our staff, but we're not expanding our buildings. We got 28 new staff this year from the state, but we didn't go and ask for another building or another location. What we're trying to do is use telework and other ways that we can have them come in and out of the buildings, have a place to stop, load up their computer, do that, or see a client in a private space because we have to have you know HIPAA compliance. And so see a client in a private space. So how we would build that out would be that we would have a, a ability to move over, it's more, it's more square footage. So we'd have the ability to move over the programs that are currently in that other location, but also create that leverage for us so that in the future, we're not coming back and asking you for any more space. We're doing more of consolidation because more and more people are teleworking. So we've kind of put it through those type of um, avenues and when we thought of how it might look, what we might do there. It wouldn't just be office space that is the exact office space of where we were. It would be a way that we can bring in more staff and have them have an ability to be in a building where like programs are or where they can connect the client to some other program. But you said this isn't in the current budget proposal? <clears throat> no, it is. It is? Yes, this is my ask. This is oh, my big ask. So yes. If we vote on it, we're good? Yes. That's all I want to know. <laughs> Linwood, I like the way you cut to the chase, my brother. <laughs> yeah, John. It. You mentioned that it's, it's across the board that I Maybe mean, if we had more money or more spaces, the certified people aren't out there to hire. So I think that's there's more demand than there is supply. Mm -hmm. So my thought process was it would seem to me like this is a regional problem that if that if everyone, and I don't know how it could work, but other places that solve these issues hire people that aren't yet qualified and they hire those people on the condition that by X period <laughs> they get their certification and the agency then helps pay those the instruction and all the things that go with that because if you've got to build supply then you're gonna have to organically build it i don't know if you've looked at those options oh, yes. or if the regions looked at those options but i think this is not just an acute this is a structural shortfall i think you would concur and therefore it requires some kind of like in the military you hire all these basic recruits, but you manufacture yeomen, you manufacture weapons people. We're going to have to manufacture these, bring these people through a process and get them the certifications and hire them without them, I think. Right, right. And I hope that, you, that that is part of your strategy, and I think that should be really the regional approach because everyone benefits, and I think Tidewater should, should be, or some with Norfolk State or ODU, I don't know how all that works mm -hmm. to get all those certifications, but that really is a, a regional it is. mission. We do a lot. We have a regional training committee that's helping to support that effort. But then the other thing that we do, and I'll use child and youth as an example, they supervise people towards their license. So we need more licensed people. So the licensed people who are able to do that help to give them those hours. They work for us, and we're getting them towards that license. So we, we definitely are doing that. Right. It's incredibly important to grow and be able to support people in training and, and getting that certification. You're right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Just a, a very quick comment. Yesterday afternoon, I had the opportunity to meet with Neva, who is working on our sustainability plan update, and she sort of gave us an overview of, of the comments in those community conversations that we had, uh, three groups, and she said the thing that had added this time that they had not heard in previous times was a great concern for mental health. Mm -hmm. And, and that was just across the board from all of the groups that we had. And so I, I think one of the things that certainly occurred from the pandemic is that we've, we've all begun to recognize these issues. And you have to recognize you've got an issue before you can resolve it. But I just thought you might like to know how high that was on the list of concerns that our public brought to us. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're really looking for us to do something. So. Certainly. Yeah, the isolation, bring on depression, 
right. uh, using substances, all of that. And so that is that is definitely something that's been on our minds as well, and we've we heard it to too. need to address these things. So I think, you know, it's, it's certainly something that people are aware of now, and now's the time that we need to do something about it. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, yeah, Sabrina. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's certainly a um, heartfelt thank you for serving the families in need through those outreach programs that you provide and certainly have had an opportunity to uh, attend and participate. I um, hope to do more of that because I think it's essential. Um, but in terms of the P6 expansion, um, when I hear about all of the um, perhaps the the incentives or um, the help associated with putting everything in a in convenience of in a one-stop shop. Can't help help but think about um, a family that I have been working with, who had has a son who had a tumultuous experience um, due to some behavioral health issues. Uh, and he was certainly rerouted um, to several places, ended up in jail, and the experience that he had was just unthinkable. Uh, can't help but think of if we had something of this nature, um, how perhaps um, the devastation uh, and the experience that he had would have possibly uh, been diverted. And so uh, I certainly support that expansion uh, in hopes that we are able to uh, really help uh, divert individuals who need that assistance to the right people and the resources, um, because there are a, a, a lot of stories, um, specifically that story that I'm familiar with in the family, that are still reeling and hurting from the experience that uh, they've had, and we have not talked to all of the departments and institutions that were a part of that situation. But we hope to, and uh, hopefully the solution will be, I know it's going to be um, uh, a strategy, it's, it, the strategy is going to be multi-pronged, but out of uh, that solution, I, I'm hoping that we would at least have these kinds of resources. We're going to have to address legislation because that's an issue as well. Um, but uh, again, I do certainly support that expansion. And you know, I would like to see issues uh, like the one that I'm working with uh, really end in a better way for people who have behavioral health needs. Certainly. Yeah. So would we. Mr. Thank you for all that you do. Rocky. And your staff. Director Smith, I, I couldn't let you go away without saying the Lord's work you're doing in the Correctional Center, and we appreciate it. You're making a huge difference, and uh, I think as you track those numbers and the statistics we've had in the jail, helping the incarcerated has been unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, I've even heard that we're a model program throughout the Commonwealth with what we're doing. So yes, let your people know we surely appreciate it, and it's making a big difference in a lot of folks' lives. So yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you yeah. very much. And they and Lynn, let me close out by saying, you know, the gratitude that I believe we have for you and your staff. You know, being a uh, health care provider for a couple decades back in the 90s and recently, I had to use your services, you know, especially APS and, mm -hmm. you know, being in people's homes and you, you see it all. But I think what folks have to appreciate that as the ills and challenges of society exacerbate, it falls directly upon you. You know, with increases of fentanyl, with, uh, you know, and all the opioids and uh, the amount of depression and everything, and, we, you know, we really doing that. And, uh, you know, I think John Moss said on a point that we're going to, we're going to need some collateral help, you know, to, you know, to give you a hand. And we got a couple of things. Um, you know, we met with the uh, director of uh, public, as, uh, the secretary of public safety and homeland defense the other day, you know, talking about violence issues. And the one thing we really talked about was the identification that a lot of violence, especially youth violence, 
is to, you know, related to mental health issues that, you know, we've just got to embrace the problem that we really haven't done before. And, you know, we have an idea commission that hopefully, uh, you know, we're going to start giving the, you the resources of putting many of the faith-based community together that mm -hmm. you could help at least form a bridge because, but once again, when you think about it, and, you know, we just got to be honest, your responsibilities are pretty much cradle to grave. You cover mm -hmm. everything. Correct. And you cover the biggest challenges that are out there. And in a city of 460,000 people, when you think about the monumental, um, you know, uh, challenges and responsibilities that you have, and COVID didn't help, it exacerbated things. You have done, a re and your staff, a remarkable job, and we thank you. Yes, they have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, okay moving on. All right, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, CVB and Resort Manager will come and present on their proposed budget for their department. Hello. Hello. Um, I know that I was had the opportunity to present just a couple of weeks ago, so I'll keep my presentation brief. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll certainly be happy to answer them. But good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. Thank you for the opportunity to present our proposed FY23 budget highlights. Um, with me today are the Resort Administrator, Lisa Blakely, and Director of Administration, Michelle Boyette, who are here to assist and answer any questions that you may have. Wait, I'm doing this. Okay. So this slide is an overview of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, and CVB has three funding sources, the General Fund, the TAP Fund, and the TIP Fund. This is a breakdown of how our budget is distributed by division. This chart represents our general fund. Um, we met target and are ready to move forward in FY23 to continue the business of creating economic impact for our destination. The TAP fund is where the sales and marketing functions happen that create economic impact for our destination. As a destination marketing organization, our marketing and advertising program receives the majority of our TAP fund budget. <laughs> You'll notice that we had a great summer last season, and as a result, we have a net increase of $700,000 to reinvest in our program. For the next slide and for the TIP fund, I'd like to welcome Resort Administrator Lisa Blakely up to discuss the TIP fund. Welcome. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council. I'm appreciative to Nancy to allow me to come and tag team with her today to thank you personally for your support of the Resort Management Office programs and for your leadership in reestablishing the Resort Management Office in December of 2020. I'm also thankful for an engaged community of stakeholders and supporting city departments without whom much of our work could not be possible. The RMO team is a small but not but mighty one. We focus on the work of providing a safe and welcoming environment in the Virginia Beach Resort area. We, um, our responsibilities include permitting functions um, with special events and film, cafe franchises, boardwalk vendors. We also oversee um, several contracts, including the um, city entertainment uh, contract, then the um, Beach Ambassadors Service Agreement, which is will be going into a contract um, mode soon. And then we also oversee um, the beach rentals. So several things that down there in the resort area. Uh, a very uh, primary part of what we are responsible for is to faci facilitate projects and initiatives and maintenance that is um, done in the resort area. We also um, are appreciative of the partnership that we have with housing and neighborhood preservation and also the planning department because indirectly we work with the um, homeless outreach team, a dedicated zoning inspector, and a dedicated code enforcement inspector to do our work. The RMO is fully funded by the Tourism Investment Program Fund. And in FY23, as you'll see on the slide, the increase in the RMO of 4.2 million will enable increased entertainment 
and cosmetic infrastructure improvements that have been identified in the public spaces of the oceanfront. Thank you. Um, so then I know that I gave you an updated and a detailed overview just a few weeks ago, so I'll move quickly through this slide as well. As you can see, we have a path to move forward post-COVID in recovery mode and in all of our markets, so that's what we're laser focused on, um, returning business to Virginia Beach. Um, Lisa addressed some of these when she discussed the TIP fund. So if you're okay with that, I'll be happy to move forward to the next slide. <clears throat> and finally, we're keeping our foot on the gas and our finger on the pulse at CVB. We're working hard to capitalize on post-pandemic opportunities. In addition to the sales, marketing, customer service, venue, and event management programs that we're known for, we're also busy working on the development of strategy and an infrastructure that will create a modern, efficient, successful, and sustainable CVB that delivers the highest return on investment. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding our budget. Any questions at this point, Guy? I don't have a question. I just want to thank Nancy for her leadership. She's done a great job. I want to thank Lisa as well. Uh, I'm reminded when I first uh, heard about the the resort management offices that existed in a prior iteration, and um, somebody just said, it's hard to describe unless you're there every day, but it just makes everything work better. And that's exactly what has happened under Lisa's leadership. The things that used to fall in the crack about uh, the resort manage management and maintenance uh, whether it be working with the homeless problems or, or, uh, or, or, or the cosmetics, as Lisa mentioned, or the more important personnel, just coordinating city services that are already there, but that sometimes need, need to be coordinated. And there was nobody really that could <coughs> do it. And Lisa's done a great job with it. She's, she's fulfilled, I think, every expectation that the re resort area folks, government and non-government had. And, um, and she's made a great team with the CBB folks as well. So I just want to say thank you to both of you ladies for a great job. Well thank done. You. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Hi, how are Hi, you? Nice good. to see you. Nice Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, as you know, I represent a part of the city that um, is, uh, is not a hub of tourism. However, um, the tourism industry impacts every aspect of life in our yes. community. In fact, growing up in Virginia Beach, you know, one is becomes acutely aware that we have a culture of hospitality, that our economy is, um, is hugely driven by um, our hospitality industry, and it's a source of pride um, and revenue for our city, and one that we're all very grateful for and proud of. Um, and, of course, many of the people who, work, who live in my district uh, work at the resort, um, are beneficiaries of the um, financial impact that uh, resort businesses and tourism provide for our city, um, and enjoy the amenities that exist there too. So having said all that, and with that acknowledgement, I'm going to ask some more difficult questions. Shoot. Uh, because I'm concerned about a pattern of decision making that has occurred around um, city appointed boards and commissions. And I just want to, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I hope okay. you don't mind that. <laughs> Uh, nope. But I feel it's my obligation to do so um, because I want to make sure that we get out, get out for the record um, that there is a clear distinction between boards and commissions that are advisory uh, committees to city council. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that distinction is clear and evident and that it's stated for the record um, because um, decision making around uh, policy and around um, regulatory authority resides here at council, the buck stops here, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. Oh, sure. Okay. Councilmember, we could not agree more. Thank you for the comment. Certainly, uh, certainly everyone on city staff understands that this is the ultimate policy-making body for the, uh, for the city and that, uh, that anybody uh, that is appointed to a board or commission that is, uh, is, is subject to the will of this body and the policy-making authority as extended from this body specific to the powers associated with that, uh, some containing appro 
the ability to spend money that you appropriate, some that do not. But but thank you for the clarification, and, and we appreciate and that I, very and much. And the reason I'm asking is because, of course, thank you, Mr. Adams, taxpayer resources are um, a very precious, uh, very, very precious. Yes, sir. And uh, they must be used um, and, and uh, employed in a way that's very thoughtful and considerate. And while the stakeholder influence is critical, it's, it's absolutely needed, and we, we should 100% uh, and always keep in mind the role that uh, industry leaders and individual stakeholders have in that decision making. This industry and everything about it impacts the whole city, as we previously acknowledged. And, yes. and I think it's absolutely critical because there are some decisions that have concerned me um, that have been made recently, and, and uh, we could point to for the past, I won't go, no, no need to get specific now, that we establish for the record the role that boards and commissions have in this decision-making sort of matrix and context. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? John, uh, oh, John. Barbara, 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 then John. Go ahead. I'll, no, no. I'll follow you. I just want if you could revisit... Like what expenses are funded by the general fund, which is sure. getting back to Michael's all taxpayers? I know there's some FTEs because I remember when we made that transition of out of the tip fund to the general tax fund. But what are the uh, Hold on. how many people are we now paying for the general fund? All of them, or just um, for the for the most part? I'm going to ask Michelle Boyette to come up also and assist with that that question. Um, we still have a few that are in the TAP fund based on the type of work that they do. If it's directly related to marketing and advertising, it makes sense in that space. Give the breakdown Welcome. to staff. Hi. Um, yes. Come on so, forward to the mic. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. So in the TAP fund, uh, about $1.3 million uh, is salaries within the TAP fund. Every, all, all other salaries are in the general fund. And that would be, what's the total general fund appropriation? For? For? for your office for the budget unit where we're, we're being briefed on today what does the general fund exclusively yeah. first for labor it well it's labor and operations depending up for a mold for there are several divisions that have funding in the general fund okay but so how many of the positions in exactly is that geez at all but was that there's, of the 119 positions how many uh, are in the general 100 102 103 so there's about 12 positions that so that's the fund. general fund is paying that for this function mm -hmm. right that's quite a bit of money. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody, Barbara? Well, that's similar to what I was was going to uh, ask because I think what we we hear so often is that we're spending too much money at the oceanfront. I mean, that's the basic thing that we get from a lot of folks, and and I think that it's not clear what is spent from the various funds and how. And I know it's in, it's in the budget, uh, but it's a very big document, and it's Correct. hard to pull out. So it's easier if y'all can do it in a very simple way to encapsulate what is TIP, what is TAP, and then what's general fund, because I think we really have to, to be able to answer uh, these questions. And then, of course, what the revenue is generated. And, mm -hmm. and too often, we don't include all of the revenue that's generated because we we might include the, um, I guess what we call them, the trustee funds with the, the sales tax and the meal tax and the hotel. We forget to put in things like real estate tax and, and personal property tax, which goes to the general fund, not to the tip or tap. So I, I think in order to clarify just how much money the general taxpayer is paying to the oceanfront, mm -hmm and what the benefit is to the whole city. We just really need it as simply as we can so that we can answer these questions. If it would be helpful, Mr. Duhaney, can we put something in the Friday packet that would break down those it expenditures? Yeah. We'll be happy to do that. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, Linwood. Yeah, just, uh, I'd just like to add to what uh, Mr. Tower said about uh, everybody doing a great job, but we've had a, a big turnover in leadership. Um, in these uh, departments, uh, in addition to Lisa, uh, Nancy's our newest CVB director, and Taylor is overseeing the whole operation, and we have a lot of other new people in the position, so uh, we're assembling a really good team, and uh, if you guys can get anywhere near to this summer, like we had last year, we'll appreciate it very much. Thank you. That's Thank the you. goal. Hey, anyone else? 
You know, if I could say this, uh, you know, I know uh, sometimes I may uh, drive folks, uh, you know, a little uh, pushed to the edge with, you know, leadership, organizational leadership and, you know, things like that, which is kind of my background a bit, you know, process <coughs> improvement and things like that. But there's a term that I think is very impactful, and that's transformational leadership. You know, taking somebody that once was and making something that is that is better for everybody. And I think over about the last you know year or so, we have seen a perfect example of transformational leadership. And it really started with the success of the sports center. And you know, it, and you see people starting to live at the ocean front. And I think about, uh, you know, when people talk about the oceanfront and, you know, are concerned about people that may live out in the districts, Michael's district, Sabrina's district, all the other districts, you know, we want them to feel welcome at their beach. And, you know, working on the things like the par par parking problems and safety, it's coming. And you can see the transformation coming on Atlantic Avenue and the spirit. And let me just say that, you know, kudos to you and your staff. And, you know, I got to meet the ambassadors a couple times at events and yeah, things amazing. of that nature. A remarkable group of people. But what we saw a couple of weeks ago, you know, the Shamrock Marathon proved that we are back. And in spite of COVID and everything, we had pretty much the best summer in a long time, maybe ever, you know, in terms of hotels and things. But when you think about the organization and leadership it takes to effectively do something as magnanimous as the Shamrock Marathon, we had, what, 20,000 runners in two days? 25, yeah. It was a sea of green. And, uh, you know, I can't, you know, thank you enough. And I think it, it was a tremendous launch uh, of the East Coast Surfing Championships. We're going to take that to the next level there. Yeah. You know, we're going to have the top surfers in the world come to Virginia Beach. And, you know, and then with the Wave Park, you know, uh, on cue and things of that nature, I think things bode well for people that live all over the, the entire population, 460,000 strong in Virginia Beach, but also the, the folks in the 757 that, you know, our, their oceanfront is going to be their beach too. Absolutely. And it, it starts off with transformational leadership, and I thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, just realizing that we're basically about 20 minutes until we project to go into closed session. Do you have any issue if we maybe ask economic development for their operating CIP to come next week so council could go through um, whatever it needs to get? Would that be okay, with? folks? Yes. Yep. Okay, good enough. So at this point, we will go ahead and move on. To, uh, I believe it's right now any council discussions, initiatives, or comments. Anyone? Rosemary? I wanted to, uh, I haven't really talked about this much in a while, but uh, May 1st, I think a lot of you remember that I do an event called Crush Cancer, and it's going to be raising funds for uh, <clears throat> cancer research. And 100% of the money raised will go to the research, and that's one way we can work to defeat this terrible, terrible disease. And so uh, it's, it's going to be an outdoor event. It's on stationary bikes, and people can form teams and uh, raise money to defeat cancer. And <clears throat> the website is letscrushcancer.org, let's crush and you can have a team or you can donate or just come out May 1st. It's going to be at the Cavalier Golf and Yacht Club, and it's going to be a really great event. And so this will be, we've been doing this over eight-year period, and we've raised $1.6 million for it. So it's it's really making an impact. Rosemary, thank you. Anyone else? John? Yes, just briefly, and I'll discuss it when the item comes up, but you'll find at your dais when you arrived, I had an alternative. I have been strongly supportive of what we've been trying to do at Pembroke, but I wasn't operating under the belief that we were going to use the development authority 
versus the city itself to be the party to the agreement, and that caught me somewhat by surprise. Um, I personally believe that, and I've confirmed that we can legally, the city can do this deal, and we don't need a development authority. This isn't part of the TIF. This is ultimately to become parking. We're financing the, they're financing the thing in the end it's to be a free parking lot. And my proposal is that the city council be the, the partner, not the Virginia Beach Development Authority. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else? Okay, we're ready for agenda review. Okay, there's quite a few things that are pulled. So, I, <clears throat> under J, uh, one and two, we have speakers on. Uh, three, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said was one. Yes, J1 and J2, we have speakers. One and two speakers? Yes, we do. J3, uh, the ordinance to declare the properties located at 108 Laverne Avenue, uh, 108 Air Station Drive. Uh, is everybody okay with that? Remember that being brief, yes. Okay. Number four, 4A, we have a speaker. Um, but I don't believe we have a B and C. Vice Mayor, we don't have a, a we don't have a speaker on 4A. The most current list I just sent you is okay. Okay, well then, 4A is to relocate the central absentee precinct for the June 2022 primary election to 577 Central Drive. Is everybody okay with that? And then B is um, regarding the residential parking permits i've got some questions about that uh, you want it pulled yeah i i i, I don't I, i'm going to support the uh, ordinance i don't know that i need it pulled but i do need to ask some questions i'd like to do it on the record so i would like that pulled i i think that's best okay number c um fishing on the beach during resort season at little island park is everybody okay with that Okay, all right, 5A and 5B, we do have speakers on. And number six, the resolution designated May as Mental Health Month. Everybody okay with that? Number seven, resolution regarding the City of Virginia Beach Community Criminal Justice Board. Everybody's okay? Eight, uh, we have speakers. Number nine, resolution to approve a term sheet regarding the development. I guess we need to pull that. Correct. Uh, Ten, uh, resolution to authorize and direct the city manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement between Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services in the city regarding purchase of agricultural reserve program easements. Is everybody okay? Number 11. Uh, ordinance to extend the date for satisfying the conditions regarding the closing one half of an unimproved portion of Holly Road and adjacent to 401 49th Street. 12. Um, resolution to appoint Lauren Hopkins to the position of Deputy City Clerk. Um, effective April 14th. <laughs> yes. If you haven't had a, an opportunity to meet her, she's really delightful, and I'm, I know we'll all get to meet her soon. Everybody okay with? Uh, 13, resolutions to request the Virginia Department of Transportation, VDOT, to accept A, additional streets for the urban maintenance payments, and B, correction to the road inventory for the urban maintenance pay payments. Everybody okay? 14, um, ordinance to award a 5,000 community service micro grant to Virginia Beach Fire Foundation regarding child passenger safety training programs, public education, and child safety seat checkup events. Okay. Uh, 15, we have speakers. 16, there's A and B, uh, accept and appropriate $8,868 donation from the Virginia Beach Library Foundation. And B is a surplus funding from the Virginia Department of Transportation regarding capital project Elbow Road extended phase of 2B. Everybody okay with those? I'm okay, but I had some questions that because of the phone system today and trying to dial in here wasn't the easiest. But I do have some questions on that, but I can get them answered afterwards. But I, can we <coughs> two, I don't want to pull it, but I, I'm willing to put it on consent. But my questions were this. First of all, I've asked on several occasions 
are we certain that we don't need to reprice our CIP program because of what's happening? And the narrative of this thing says we are having to transfer and put money in a project <coughs> because of inflationary prices. The narrative is not consistent with the answers previously given at this podium by staff. And I want to get with the city manager and understand why that is. But I'm not pulling it. I'm going to vote for it. Thank you. Okay, 17, we have speakers for A. Um, no, ma'am. No? Mm -mm. Well, Madam Vice Mayor. Yes. If, if I could go back to number 12 with the appointment of Lauren Hopkins. Uh-huh. I want to I applaud uh, Madam Clerk for this. This Lauren Hopkins is exactly the kind of person we need in the city. We talk about how our young people go away and don't come back. Well, this is a young person that grew up here in Kempsville and is a heart and soul of Kempsville and has made a decision to go away to college and come back and work here in Virginia Beach. And, and I applaud you for that because that's exactly what we need more of that. And we're lucky to have her. We are. Thank okay, you. So I can't wait to meet her. Right. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll you're bring her in. She's back. Oh, she's back there. I, I think she's back Lauren, here, and I just up. embarrassed her bring a little her bit. Up. Can we bring her up oh, real quick? Sure. Yeah, yeah, come, come on up here. and say hi. Put you on the spot. <laughs> so I'll tell you all just a little bit about Lauren. She graduated from Kentsville High School. She uh, was a soccer and a field hockey player there. She went to Mary Washington, graduated, and she played field hockey there as well. Um, we're happy to have her. She lives in the Aragona part of the city. And again, it's 100% it's true that you know, it's great for young people to come back here and, and want to want to work and live here. So we're super excited to have Lauren. Welcome. Go ahead. Welcome. <laughs> Let me tell you. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. You're, you're, just everybody in Virginia Beach is watching you right now. So, you know. Everybody wants you to succeed. Thank you. I appreciate she, that. And let's put it this way: you have a history of carrying a big stick around, so you know. She does, and, and Mr. Mayor, she made a lot of goalies nervous at Mary Washington because when she shot on goal, she made it. So I guarantee Thank you that. You. Well, thank you, guys. I'm welcome very excited. To thank you and together. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you for coming to work here. Okay, so 17 A and B, then there's no speakers, is that right? Other than one? There's no speakers on either one. Okay. But if I could, uh, I just want to yes. applaud the city manager for that very thoughtful um, memo and action plan that he provided us. I was that certainly set a benchmark that was very much appreciated. Thank you. Then we got a planning item. We have one planning item on uh, North Independent Storage LLC. Formerly District 4, Bayside, Mr. Jones. Well, there, there's been some significant changes to, the, to the, this development plan. I, are there any speakers signed up? No, sir, up? not signed up as of yet. Okay. Uh, I'm okay with it if, uh, unless there's speakers because of the changes that have happened. Okay. Okay, I'm going to vote no. I just think. <coughs> okay. Well, all right. I'll, I'll speak to that. Thank you. Just if I could ask yes. a question. Back all the way up to item two, um, which we have speakers on. I was just going to say I was kind of surprised that we've got the public hearing tonight and the vote at the same time. So kind of depending on, it might be that the speakers need to be at the public hearing and then we can determine whether we're going to go forward with hearing it or if they raise issues. I, I was so, just surprised to see them both on the same agenda. Uh, we only have one speaker on the public hearing. No, one speaker post in, on the public hearing. Well, shouldn't that be where the speakers are? Uh, well, she signed up on all the items. Uh, but, I mean, if, if we're looking at, at approving it as item two, I would really like to hear in the comments on the public hearing, but either place. Yes. Because so that's, that's the issue, right? It's the, it's so the, the public hearing ones. will come first, and, and we do have, a, we have two speakers for it. One is in favor, one is opposed. The opposition has signed up on every item. Oh, so the only opposition is is the one. Okay, I didn't know if we had a, a large this number point, of people yes, that were speaking against it. If so, because I have not had any calls. And uh, all right, okay, I understand now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Making sure it's not the power one. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Mayor. Okay, at this point, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meetings allowed by Section 2.2711A, uh, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property 
for public purpose or disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the body uh, pursuant to section 2.237 11A3. Princess Anne District, Rose Hall District, Lynn Haven District. Public contract discussions of the award of a public contract involved in the expenditure of public funds and discussion of the terms or scope of such contract where discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.237A29, Atlantic Park Project Beach, TCC Hotel, Project Signs, Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance. And then also personnel matters, discussions, considerations, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1, and that's council appointees, council boards, commissions, uh, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, uh, you know, moved by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Moss. Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have recessed into closed session. Okay, we are recessed into executive. Thank you all very much.